Since its inception in the 1950s, the field of artificial intelligence has vacillated between periods of optimistic predictions and massive investment, and periods of disappointment, loss of confidence, and reduced funding. Even with today's seemingly fast pace of AI breakthroughs, the development of long-promised technologies such as self-driving cars, housekeeping robots, and conversational companions has turned out to be much harder than many people expected. Professor Melanie Mitchell thinks one reason for these repeating cycles is our limited understanding of the nature and complexity of intelligence itself. Overconfident predictions about AI are as old as the field itself. In 1958, for example, the New York Times reported on a demonstration by the US Navy of Frank Rosenblatt's Perceptron, which was a precursor to today's neural networks. They said, the Navy revealed the embryo of an electronic computer today that it expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, and reproduce itself and be conscious of its own existence. In 1960, the AI pioneer Herbert Simon declared that machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work that a man can do. The following year, Claude Shannon echoed this prediction, saying that he confidently expected that within a matter of 10 or 15 years, something will emerge from the laboratory, which is not too far from the robot of science fiction fame. And a few years later, Marvin Minsky predicted that within a generation, the problems of creating artificial intelligence will be substantially solved. By the latter part of the 1980s, these optimistic hopes had all been dashed. Again, none of these technologies had achieved the lofty promises that had been made. Expert systems, which rely on humans to create rules that capture expert knowledge of a particular domain, turned out to be brittle. That is to say, often unable to generalize or adapt when faced with new situations. The problem was that human experts writing the rules actually relied on subconscious knowledge, what you might call common sense, that was not part of the system's programming. The 1990s and 2000s saw the meteoric rise of machine learning, the development of algorithms which create predictive models from data. These approaches were typically inspired by statistics rather than neuroscience or psychology and were aimed at performing specific tasks rather than capturing general intelligence. Machine learning practitioners were often quick to differentiate their discipline from the then discredited field of artificial intelligence. Soon after Alex Krzyzewski's ImageNet moment, deep learning emerged from the last position in the pack and rose to superstar prominence. This led to an unrelenting maelstrom of hype and optimistic future predictions. Stuart Russell, co-author of a widely used textbook on AI, predicted that super intelligent AI will probably happen in the lifetime of his children. Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, predicted that within decades, computer programs will do almost everything, including making new scientific discoveries that will expand our concept of everything. Shane Legg, the co-founder of Google DeepMind, predicted in 2008 that human-level AI will be passed in the mid-2020s. And Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg declared in 2015 that one of Facebook's goals for the next five to 10 years is to basically get better than human level at all of the primary human senses, vision, hearing, language, and general cognition. However, as Melanie points out, it didn't take long for cracks to appear in the deep learning facade of intelligence. It turns out that like all AI systems of the past, deep learning systems also suffer from brittleness, unpredictable errors when facing situations that differ from the training data. One of the main reasons for this is that deep learning systems are susceptible to shortcut learning, which is to say, learning statistical associations in the training data that allow the machine to produce correct answers 
but sometimes for the wrong reasons. The sources of their brittleness and vulnerability are still not completely understood. These networks with their large number of parameters are complicated systems. Their decision-making mechanisms are almost completely opaque. The non-human-like errors and vulnerability to adversarial examples are strong indicators that these systems are not actually understanding the data that they process, at least not in the human sense. Something fundamental is still missing. And the other thing is that deep learning systems require big data. Large-scale vision and language models are only possible because of the billions of images and documents which are now accessible on the internet. If you've ever uploaded an image to Flickr, it's possible that your image is now part of the ImageNet training set. If you've ever had to prove that you're not a robot, your metadata might now be used by Google to tag an image. Microsoft researchers Eric Horvid said that right now, what we're doing is not a science, it's a form of alchemy. And Dennis Hassibilis from DeepMind says, it's almost like an art form to get the best out of these systems. There's only a few hundred people in the world who are experts at doing it well. Um, Mark Serafim was on our show recently and he pointed out in his Great Stagnation article that there's a new priesthood class in artificial intelligence with the PhD program now becoming the extended interview process for the prestigious tech industry jobs. One of the reasons for the success of this YouTube channel and other similar YouTube channels is that many aspirational data scientists want to make six-figure salaries training a neural network with more than five layers and seven figures if it has more than 50 layers. Luckily for these aspirational people, the networks cannot yet teach themselves. Most people in artificial intelligence trace the field's official founding to a small workshop in 1956 at Dartmouth College, organized by a young mathematician named John McCarthy. Even though the most advanced computers at the time were about a million times slower than today's smartphones, McCarthy and colleagues were optimistic that AI was in close reach. Obstacles soon arose, of course, that would be familiar to anyone organizing a scientific workshop today. The Rockefeller Foundation came through with only half the requested amount of funding, and it turned out to be harder than McCarthy had thought to persuade the participants to actually come and then stay, not to mention agree on anything. There were lots of interesting discussions, but not a lot of coherence. As usual in such meetings, everyone had a different idea, a hearty ego, and much enthusiasm for their own plan. The soon-to-be big four pioneers of the field, McCarthy, Minsky, Alan Newell, and Herbert Simon, met and did some planning for the future. Right from the very beginning, there were many different schools of thought about how to achieve artificial intelligence. Mathematicians generally promoted mathematical logic and deductive reasoning as the language of rational thought. Others championed inductive methods where programs extract statistics from data and use probabilities to deal with uncertainty. Still others believe firmly in taking inspiration from biology and psychology to create brain-like programs. The fascinating thing is now, in 2021, we're having exactly the same arguments. Human intelligence is a marvelous, subtle and poorly understood phenomenon. There's no danger of duplicating it anytime soon. And also the roboticist and former director of MIT's AI lab, Rodney Brooks, agreed, stating that we grossly overestimate the capabilities of machines, those of today and of the next few decades. The psychologist and AI researcher Gary Marcus, who we've had on the show, went so far as to assert that the quest to create strong AI that is general human level AI, there's been almost no progress made. Hi, I'm Letizia. You might not know me, but you might know Miss Coffee Bean from the AI Coffee Break YouTube channel. Together with the guys from MLST, I had the honor today of speaking to Melanie Mitchell, who is the Davis Professor of Complexity at the Santa Fe Institute and Professor of Computer Science at Portland State University. Her current research focuses on conceptual abstraction, analogy making and visual recognition in artificial intelligence systems. Melanie is the author or editor of six books 
and numerous scholarly papers in the fields of artificial intelligence, cognitive science and complex systems. Her latest book is Artificial Intelligence, a Guide for Thinking Human. In Melanie's book, she explores how intelligent the best AI programs really are and how they work and when they fail. She discusses how human-like we expect them to become and how soon we need to worry about them surpassing us. Melanie wanted to understand the true affairs in artificial intelligence, what computers can do now and what we can expect from them over the next decades. What do we actually mean by general human or even superhuman intelligence? Is current AI close to this level or even on a trajectory to get there? Melanie originated the Santa Fe Institute's Complexity Explorer platform, which offers online courses and other educational resources related to the field of complex systems. Her online course, Introduction to Complexity, has been taken by over 25,000 students and is one of the Course Central's top 50 online courses of all time. Melanie's PhD was supervised by Douglas Hofstetter, a legend in AI and the author of a famous book cryptically titled Gödel Escherbach, An Eternal Golden Braid, or more succinctly, GB. If you're a computer scientist or a computer enthusiast, you've probably heard of it, or read it, or tried to read it. <laughs> Written in the 1970s, GB was an outpouring of Hofstetter's many intellectual passions like mathematics, art, music, language, humor and wordplay, all brought together to address the deep questions of how intelligence, consciousness and the sense of self-awareness that each human experiences so fundamentally can emerge from the non-intelligent, non-conscious substrate of biological cells. It's also about how intelligence and self-awareness might eventually be attained by computers. It's a unique book and it's not an easy read and yet it became a bestseller and won both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. Without a doubt, GB inspired more young people to pursue AI than any other book. Melanie was one of them and she persuaded Hofstetter to take her on as a research assistant first for a summer and then for the next six years as a graduate student, after which she graduated with a doctorate in computer science from Michigan. I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Melanie at least as much as Miss Coffee Bean did. This is a clip of Douglas Hofstadter talking at Stanford. If we are going to make any connection between analogy and, and a geographical situation, we're going to liken it to the interstate freeway system and it links everything together. Analogy is the interstate freeway system of cognition. It is not one little tiny zone somewhere off in the side. It's, so that's a, that's a kind of a, a way of, a, a, that I think about it. I mean, I don't really usually think about it that way. I made that up yesterday, so. Uh, but it gives you the flavor. Categorization is the name of the cognition game, but analogy is the mechanism that creates or that allows categorization to happen. By categorization, I mean uh, deciding what something is, what the essence of something is. Now, one could sort of summarize this in a corny little analogy. Again, analogy is the motor of the car of thought, and then we then can even write it down as this uh, little thing. Analogy is to thinking as a motor is to a car. A is to B as C is to D. Analogy making is the perception of common essence between two things. And then a couple of footnotes to sort of hedge. Um, I mean, things don't have essences, but what I mean, I, I'm not a, you know, I'm not talking about some kind of abstract, glowing philosophical essence. I'm talking about the essence that you perceive at the particular time in the frame of mind that you happen to be in. And, uh, and by, when I say things, it's tempting to think that the analogies are between the things in the external world, but I really want to say that analogies happen inside your head, so that they're, they're there are connections between two mental representations. There are connections between things inside your head, uh, which we project to the outside world. And we say these things outside, out there are analogous, and that's very reasonable to do.
DeepMind's original mission statement was solve intelligence and use it to solve everything else. There was a meeting booked at the Googleplex. A group of select Google AI researchers wanted to hear from and converse with the main man, Douglas Hofstadter. Hofstadter invited Melanie to join him for the discussion. Hofstadter got up to speak and he said he had some remarks about AI research in general and there at Google in particular. His voice became passionate. He said, I'm terrified. I'm terrified. Hofstadter went on. He described how when he first started working on AI in the 1970s, it was an exciting prospect, but it just seemed so far from being realized. There was no danger on the horizon. Chess mastery, though, once seen as the pinnacle of human intelligence, had since succumbed to a brute force search. Hofstadter asked, will a computer ever write beautiful music? There was speculation. Yes, but not soon. Hofstadter continued. He said that music is a language of emotions. And until programs have emotions as complex as ours, there's no way a program will write anything beautiful. I mean, yeah, there can be forgeries, shallow imitations of the syntax of earlier music. But despite what one might think at first, there's much more to musical expression than could be captured in the syntactic rules. To think that we might soon be able to command a pre-programmed, mass-produced, mail-order, $20 desk model music box to bring forth from its sterile circuitry pieces which Chopin or Bach might have written had they lived a little bit longer. It's a grotesque and shameful misestimation of the depth of the human spirit. Hofstadter lamented a recent musical generation program called EMI. It was written by a musician called David Cope. It could produce music in the style of Chopin. It didn't sound exactly like Chopin, but it sounded enough like Chopin. And it sounded like coherent music. So this made Hofstadter feel deeply troubled. Ever since Hofstadter was a child, music had thrilled him and moved him to the very core. Every piece that he loved felt like it was a direct message from the emotional heart of the human being who composed it. It felt like it was giving him access to their innermost soul. And it felt like there was nothing more human in the world than the expression of music. Nothing. Hofstadter then recounted a lecture that he gave at the prestigious Eastman School of Music in New York. After describing EMI, Hofstadter asked the audience, including several music theory and composition faculty, to guess which of two pieces a pianist played for them. Were they the real thing or a shallow facade generated by EMI? To Hofstadter's dire shock, many of the faculty agreed that the EMI piece was an unknown but genuine Chopin. The correct answers were the reverse. In the Google conference room, Hofstadter paused, peering into their faces. No one said a word. At last, he went on. He said he was terrified by EMI. Terrified. He hated it. He was extremely threatened by it. It was threatening to destroy what he most cherished about humanity. He thought that EMI was the most quintessential example of the fears that he had about artificial intelligence. Hofstadter ended the talk with a direct reference to the very Google engineers in the room, all listening intently. He said he found it very scary, very troubling, very sad. And he found it terrible, horrifying, bizarre, baffling, bewildering that people were rushing ahead blindly and deliriously creating these things. Hofstadter's terror was in response not about the AI becoming too smart, too invasive, too malicious, or even too useful. Instead, he was terrified that intelligence, creativity, emotions, and maybe even consciousness itself would be all too easy to produce. 
that what he valued most in humanity would end up being nothing more than a bag of tricks. That a superficial set of brute force algorithms could explain the human spirit Hofstadter firmly believes that the mind and all of its characteristics emerge wholly from the physical substrate of the brain and the rest of the body, along with the body's interaction with the physical world. There's nothing immaterial or incorporeal lurking there. The issue that worries him is really one of complexity. He fears that AI might show us the human qualities we most value are disappointingly simple to mechanize. As Hofstadter explained to Melanie after the meeting, here referring to Chopin, Bach and other paragons of humanity, if such minds of infinite subtlety and complexity and emotional depth can be trivialized by a small chip, it would destroy his sense of what humanity is all about. Melanie believes that there are four fallacies in common assumptions made by AI researchers which can lead to overconfident predictions about the field. Fallacy number one, narrow intelligence is on a continuum with general intelligence. Now, thinking that building taller towers to get closer to the moon or getting a high salary job would get you closer to being a billionaire, it's flawed. Intelligence is the ultimate deceptive objective. We simply don't know what the intermediate stepping stones are to achieve it. Fallacy number two. Easy things are easy and hard things are hard. While John McCarthy lamented that AI was harder than we thought, Marvin Minsky explained that this is because easy things are hard. That's to say, the things that we humans do without much thought, you know, looking up on the world, making sense of what we see, carrying on a conversation, walking down a crowded sidewalk without bumping into anyone. You know, these things turn out to be the hardest challenges for machines. Conversely, it's often easier to get machines to do things that are very hard for humans. For example, solving complex mathematical challenges or playing board games really well. Researchers at Google DeepMind spoke of AlphaGo's triumph. They described the game of Go as being one of the most challenging of domains. But is it actually that challenging for computers? For humans, sure. As psychologist Gary Marcus, who we had on the show, pointed out, there are domains, including games, that while easy for humans, are much more challenging than Go for AI systems. One example is charades, which requires acting skills, linguistic skills, and a theory of mind. Albeit, these are far beyond anything AI can accomplish today. Marvin Minsky once said that in general, we're least aware of what our minds do best. Fallacy number three, the lure of wishful mnemonics. The term wishful mnemonic was coined in 1976 by the computer scientist Drew McDermott. It refers to the terms that were used to describe AI programs and their evaluation benchmarks, often naming terms after the skills we hope that they test. For example, in NLP, we have the Stanford Question Answering Dataset, the Reading Comprehension Dataset, and the General Language Understanding Evaluation. DeepMind's David Silver said, We can ask AlphaGo how well it thinks it's doing during the game. It was only towards the end of the game that AlphaGo thought that it would win. Melanie thinks that the constant anthropomorphization in AI is misleading the public understanding of artificial intelligence and unconsciously shaping the way that AI experts think about their systems and how closely these systems resemble human intelligence. Fallacy 4. Intelligence is in the brain. The idea that intelligence is something that can be separated from the body, whether as a non-physical substance or as a wholly encapsulated in the brain, has a long history in philosophy and cognitive science. Computationalism, or the information processing model of the mind, arose in psychology in the mid-20th century. This model views the mind as a kind of computer which inputs, stores, processes and outputs information. The body does not play much of a role, except in the input and output stages. Under this view, cognition takes place wholly in the brain, it opens up the door to a kind of pure intelligence. In many ways, in my opinion, this is intellectually lazy. You know, this line of thinking opens the door to notions of runaway superintelligence, 
or the creation of intelligence which is independent of emotions or the limitations of the physical body. The assumption that intelligence is all in the brain has led to speculation that to achieve higher level human level AI, we simply need to scale up the machines to match the brain's computing capacity and then develop the appropriate software. Embedded cognition means that the representation of conceptual knowledge is dependent on the body, it's multimodal and low level. Embodiment implies that our thoughts are grounded or inextricably associated with perception, action and emotion, and that our brain and body work together for cognition to emerge. Anyway, for those of you who are interested in some of these ideas, I strongly recommend you listen to our show with Professor Mark Bishop. By the way, I'm really sorry about the poor audio quality from Melanie's microphone on the show today. We're not 100% sure what the cause of the problem was. At Street Talk, we pride ourselves on production quality, having the best possible production quality. And this definitely falls below our standards. Um, I've done everything possible to clean up Melanie's audio, but her microphone was only sampled at about eight kilohertz. Um, giving us a maximum representable frequency of four kilohertz, as those who know about the Nyquist theorem would attest. But um, anyway, it sounds a bit like she's talking on the phone. So um, we'll make sure this never happens again. I mean, frankly, the combined amount of work that the entire team puts into preparing for these shows, a $200 microphone is like a drop in the ocean. We should have just sent it to Melanie. You know, Melanie's audio is still intelligible, but it's a real shame that the quality wasn't better. It's been my dream to get Melanie on the show for such a long time now. She's such a huge inspiration for me and I wanted it to be as good quality as it possibly could have been. So anyway, please bear with it. Um, it was still an amazing show and we'll see you back next week. Melanie, it's an absolute honor to have you on the show. Uh, I think you might be the perfect guest for me personally, actually, because I love your style and I agree with you on absolutely everything. Or maybe that doesn't make you a good <laughs> guest. I'm not sure. But um, I've just read Melanie's book, Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. It's honestly one of the best books on AI that I've ever read. I had to keep reminding myself that this book was written by a computer science professor. Melanie's style of writing is extremely accessible and uses plain language. I read, a, I read a lot of technical manuscripts preparing for this show, and it's got to the point now where I immediately recognize good prose. Technical content doesn't have to be written with high register Latinate language. Uh, Gary Marcus and Francois Cholet, by the way, are also extremely good at writing, and they have a similar kind of pragmatic, no-nonsense outlook to, uh, to Melanie. Uh, anyway, as an example of Melanie's prose, when she was describing how reinforcement learning worked in her book and its pitfalls and some of the deep mind implementations, I couldn't believe how succinctly explained it was and using so few words compared to what I would have done. Uh, it's a classic case of when people understand things deeply, they can explain it simply. I really enjoyed Melanie's book and I'm actually really inspired to read her previous book, which is Complexity, A Guided Tour. And that was um, an Amazon top 10 science book. Now, Melanie recently published a paper called Why AI is Harder Than We Think, where she outlined four key misunderstandings in current AI research. And in my opinion, Melanie is one of the most important voices in the AI world right now. That is to say, the voice of reason and pragmatism. Uh, Melanie is also an outspoken uh, critic of AI risk. We spoke about this with Jeff Hawkins last week, and I don't think we'll go into it too much today as Melanie's spoken a lot about it online. But um, I agree with Melanie that progress on giving computers moral intelligence cannot be separated from progress on other types of intelligence. So the true challenge is to create machines that have common sense and can actually understand the situations that they confront, cause and affect relationships, imagining different possible futures and understanding the beliefs and goals of others. But anyway, um, check Melanie's book to, to get more on her take on that. So um, Melanie, you said at the end of your NeurIPS talk that abstraction and analogy making in AI is still wide open much like it was in 1955 at the Dartmouth Summer Workshop proposal with the GoFi leading lights at the time. It's almost as if we haven't gotten that far since. And you said that the core problem of intelligence, which is in your view, flexibility and overcoming brittleness, still hasn't been solved. Contrast this with the unrelenting deluge of hype around artificial intelligence. I read a BBC article this morning with the headline, AI breakthrough could spark medical revolution. 
The article added fuel to the fire by saying that Nature was a prestigious journal and described the achievement as being a giant leap without using any quotation marks. And um, you wouldn't really expect that from a supposedly unbiased news source. So, Melanie, do you think this hype is getting out of control? So, so, so there is a lot of hype in AI, uh, you know, as there always has been since the very beginning of the field. This most recent uh, sort of leap, if you will, by uh, DeepMind on uh, protein folding actually perhaps is one of the first things that deserves some some of the hype. Uh, I'm not an expert on uh, protein folding prediction, but I do think that they have accomplished something really great. But, you know, what's really interesting is it's a very specific problem. It's not sort of general AI. And it's really uh, it, it, in a sort of assistance to humans rather than replacing humans. And that's perhaps where AI is actually going to uh, really succeed. Uh, th there has been a huge amount of hype, of course, around progress in AI, such as GPT-3 being able to generate human-like text and, and, you know, more recently a version of GPT-3 that can sort of uh, produce code. You know, we heard about the, you know, the GitHub Copilot, things like that. There has been a huge amount of hype in the media, but also by companies in their press releases, and even by scientists in their uh, social media posts, although people tend to be a little more careful in their academic papers. So I think that it's nothing new. AI has been subject to hype for generations, and possibly it's because it's called artificial intelligence, <laughs> which, you know, sounds so science fiction-y to, to people, and, and it's kind of... Uh, just asking for hype. Absolutely. On the subject of GPT-3, I wanted to get to that later, but we might as well do it now quickly. Um, I read your blog post at the time talking about the letter analogies, and I know that you did a lot of work with letter analogies under Douglas Hofstadter. And I was quite surprised, actually, because I, I, I reproduced many of your experiments on GPT-3, and I cited them on our epic video that we made. And um, when you do the byte pair encoding, so it GPT-3 uses byte pair encoding. So when you have uh, spaces between the letters, it works much better. And it works remarkably well in general. But what do you think is actually going on with GPT-3 on, on those letter analogies? That's a great question. Um, you know, it's a little hard to tell. GPT-3 is uh, not very transparent into how, how it works. Um, you know, I, I'm, I think it, a lot of these language models are is mysterious and, and it's unclear to what extent they're kind of memorizing their training data and, and spitting it out, perhaps a slightly different paraphrase form, or actually ha have learned some kind of conceptual representation of uh, the world and uh, the, the user through this vast amount of language that they've sort of digested. So I think that's one of the things that AI researchers uh, should be looking at is sort of what is it that these models have actually learned and how is it that we can actually probe them to make sense of what they've learned. And that's something that I'm really interested in working on. And I think that a lot more of that needs to be done. So I guess the answer is I'm, I don't know what it's doing, why, why it has the behavior it has. And it, you know, it, it does very well on certain kinds of inputs and uh, analogies and so on, and it, but then it can just uh, completely fail sometimes. And there's a whole new uh, a, a sort of uh, expertise area now called prompt engineering, which is where you have to carefully uh, design the prompt you give to these systems like GPT-3 to get the kind of uh, results that you want. And that's in some sense an intelligence test. Because we humans don't need prompt engineering, you know, you, you know, to, to most, the great extent, you can ask me a question in many, many different ways, and I'll understand you. But um, that's the kind of flexibility we want, clearly. Yeah, and about that, about that prompt engineering, you've also made the point previously that, that the ability to kind of dynamically refocus or... Uh, you know, query new bits of information is kind of a hallmark of intelligence. And one of the reasons why you're skeptical that 
deep learning as it stands today with just some finite or, or fixed forward pass, you know, kind of computation will ever work. Because in the case of GPT-3, it's just going to give you an answer, whether it understands you or not. It doesn't have the capability to say, I'm not really sure what you meant there. Can you rephrase that? Which people do, right? We have that capability. I'm wondering if you can tie that in. Yeah, so, so, so knowing what questions to ask is, is also uh, key to, to intelligence and understanding. And I don't know if anybody's ever tried to get GPT-3 to sort of ask the right questions. Uh, I doubt that it can do that. Uh, I haven't tried, but you're right. I think sort of refocusing, figuring out sort of what you don't understand and how to actually gain the information you need to understand it, that's sort of active engagement with the world or with uh, another uh, 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 someone you're communicating with that's really important yeah there's something fascinating as well because we'll get to um Hofstadter shortly but he said that um concepts are like a package of analogies and then gpt3 to a certain extent has memorized um analogies being used in lots of different situations so again Hofstadter in his book surfaces and essences he spoke about sour grapes you know the abstract uh, category and when there are so many examples of sour grapes being used in everyday language then you'd be forgiven for thinking that GPT-3 understood it but perhaps it's the sensitivity to create new abstract analogies which is where the real intelligence lies but um, I wanted to quickly get to your paper I, I really enjoyed reading it why AI is harder than we think and you came up with kind of four really important things that we should be looking at in that paper could you give us a, an outline sure so I talked about sort of these recurring cycles of optimism and disappointment in AI that people have sometimes called AI spring and AI winter, where people have sort of hyped up or, or made grand promises for their systems, and then they don't work as well as people had, had promised, and then there's disappointment. So we've seen that since the beginning of, of the field, and it continues today. And I think it has to do with our sort of misunderstandings, or I call them fallacies, about sort of the nature of intelligence itself. So one, one of the, the first fallacy, and I would say that, you know, these are not new necessarily. People have talked about these in different ways. Uh, so, but I wanted to bring them together as my sort of view of why we're, it's hard to predict where we are or, or assess where we are in AI progress. So the first fallacy was that um, pro, uh, narrow AI is on a continuum with general AI. So that the idea there is that if we make progress in some narrow task like speech recognition or machine translation or what have you, plain go, uh, that that's a step towards general intelligence. And in fact, Hubert Dreyfus, a philosopher who wrote a book a long time ago called um, uh, What Computers Still Can't Do, uh, calls this the first step fallacy, where people say, you know, GPT-3 is the first step towards general AI, or IBM Watson is the first step towards general cognition. And, you know, these are things that uh, people actually do say quite a lot. But the, there might not be a continuum there. It might not be just a series of steps like that. And Dreyfus, in fact, said that there is a discontinuity, and it's called the common sense problem, which we can talk about <laughs> what that means, that these systems are running into this barrier of common sense, and none of them can get over it. The second fallacy was um, what, what I called easy things are easy and hard things are hard. So that's the idea that things that seem very easy to us turn out to be very hard for machines and vice versa. So playing Go or playing chess and beating uh, grandmasters seems to be a pinnacle of intelligence for humans, but it's something that machines are able to do. And in fact, Dennis, Dennis Hasibis, who's the co-founder of DeepMind, called Go the most challenging of domains. But the question is most challenging for whom? Certainly challenging for me or for other humans, but uh, it, it's not necessarily the most challenging for a machine. So Gary Marcus, who you've, I think you've had on the show, um, talked about the game of charades, 
which is something that any six-year-old can play, but it's far beyond any machine because it requires visual understanding, theory of mind, all these things that machines don't have. So something that might seem very easy for us turns out to be very hard for machines. And, and people have called this Moravec's paradox because Hans Moravec talked about it. Marvin Minsky talked about it. it. It's a fallacy to think that just because you've solved something that's very hard for humans, that therefore you're closer to general AI. So then there was a third fallacy called what I, what I call the lure of wishful mnemonics. So wishful mnemonics is a wonderful term that was proposed actually in 1976 by Drew McDermott, an AI researcher from Yale, where he talked about using anthropomorphic terms to describe AI systems. And we see that today. You know, we, we even use terms like artificial intelligence, <laughs> machine learning, deep learning, uh, machine reading. Uh, we talk about these abilities, you know, general language understanding. That's something, these are the names of like benchmark data sets. But these terms in the sense of machines mean something very different than what they mean for humans. So like when, when IBM says Watson can read all the uh, medical textbooks uh, in a matter of, uh, of hours, it's not actually reading the way that we read. It doesn't understand what it reads in the same way. So that makes, but it kind of leads us astray. So I think this notion of wishful mnemonics uh, is very, uh, it, it can definitely mislead not only the general public, but also researchers themselves. And the final, let me just say the final fallacy, which I actually got a lot of negative feedback, a lot of negative emails about, is this claim that intelligence is all in the brain, which is the idea that the body doesn't matter. We can kind of sift off intelligence and implement it in a machine without worrying about all of the embodiment issues that human intelligence uh, seems to rely on. So I definitely got that one. A lot of people disagreed on it. It's very controversial. So those are my fallacies. And I use those to sort of say why I think we tend to overestimate uh, the advances that we see in AI as being getting us towards more general human-like intelligence. Yeah, and I would like to relate a little now on the third fallacy about the wishful mnemonics, because I'm a little interested to really get some actionable item out of that. And I'm interested, especially how you think about it, because you're a very down to earth person. And um, for me, I mean, it's hard to disentangle wishful mnemonics from for example, really useful terms to explain something, especially to laymen so, or even to my peers that are not really researching in exactly that topic that I am into. And if I'm writing a function, I won't call it G0023 just because it, it's hard to read. I, I, I understand it's highly misleading if I call it goal or reasoning or thinking or understanding. But um, yeah, how... How do you think about it? Because for me, it's harder said than done just to avoid wishful mnemonics because it's the easiest way to make this parallel between what I'm teaching and teaching is again a wishful mnemonic to a machine and uh, what I'm actually doing in code. Yeah, I find I also find it very difficult and humans are very um they tend to anthropomorphize everything, anything that seems to have any kind of agency. And this, this is even for the, the dumbest <laughs> AI systems. You know, go, go back to Eliza, the, the chatbot that uh, Joseph Weizenbaum built back in the, maybe the 60s, I'm not sure, uh, that, that uh, tried to uh, mimic a psychotherapist. So you would mention something about your mother and it would have some template or it would say, tell me more about your mother. And people really believe that it was understanding them because uh, they have this, this propensity to anthropomorphize. Uh, and that can be sometimes a good thing. You know, maybe if we want to build interfaces with humans where they, you know, can talk to in natural ways to the, the, the interface, 
uh, that might be a good thing, but it also can uh, fool us. So we have, I don't know if there's a actionable thing we can do there, but we have to be more aware of it. And also in, in communicating with the public, I think we have to be much more careful in if we're really going to give people the idea of what these machines are able to do, as opposed, as opposed to kind of fool them into thinking that machines are much more robust and trustworthy than they are. We have to be clearer in our language. And it's not easy, you know, it's, it's, it can be quite uh, awkward. And I'm not sure exactly how to do it, but it's something to think about. Yeah, it, it's something that you've mentioned a lot in, in your papers and, and in your book, Melanie, uh, you know, the risk of anthropomorphization in, in AI. And part of how we anthropomorphize deep learning models is based on the flawed assumption that they learn in a similar way to how humans learn. The first difference is that humans learn interactively with their environment and have thousands of multimodal input sensors to draw upon. They infer abstractions and connections between concepts as they explore the world. I mean, clearly neural networks don't learn on their own, as, as you've said in your book. Um, but you might make the argument that humans don't exactly have tons of agency either. Uh, I know Sam Harris would have uh, something to say about this, but um, you said in your Neurips talk that language-based tasks actually increases the risk of anthropomorphization. So what do you think we should do to, uh, to manage this? Right. Uh, well, I always find it very strange that, that AI people try and focus on language before they focus on sort of the basic concepts that babies learn pre-linguistically, you know, and I can see why we want to, we want to have tools, useful tools that deal with natural language, you know, machine translation is very useful, um, speech recognition, uh, chatbots, they can all be useful tools. But if we're actually getting machines to try and understand things, um, as opposed to just be some useful tool, I, I think that putting language first is sort of the cart before the horse. So for instance, in trying to teach machines common sense, there's been a lot of efforts over the years, and a lot of them start with sort of natural language. Let's teach the machines uh, things in natural language, like you can't be in two places at the same time, you know, little rules of common sense. Uh, but there, you know, there's just so much richness in these terms for us, these, these terms like even place or time, that it are, are based in our human understanding on all kinds of physical interactions with the world that we had as babies, that to like put the language first seems to be, to me, the wrong way around. Could I just ask a, a quick follow up on that before you get to the part four, Keith? Um, I, I wanted your opinion on, are these concepts kind of immutable? And can you boil them down to primitives? Because we spoke, we speak with GoFi people all the time, and they think that you can distill these concepts down to primitives that would exist universally. Even if the universe didn't exist, transitivity would still exist, right? And could you then use those primitives to, um, you know, if you compose them together correctly, you could represent any high level abstract concept or because you know when you were talking about your copycat program for example you were saying that the categories were defined a priori and the same thing with Francois Chollet's arc challenge there's this notion that core knowledge must be something which is predefined do, do you think that's the case or, or should it be something which is changing all the time yeah I guess that's a, that's a open question, I think, uh, you know, there's this notion of core knowledge that was, I think, first proposed by um, Elizabeth Spelke, who's a developmental psychologist, who said, what, what do we base all of our concepts on? It's this system of what she called core knowledge, which has to do with um, objects and their interactions and sort of spatial concepts, uh, some social concepts like, you know, I can recognize that you have agency and you, you are different from, say, the table you're sitting in front of because you're going to affect things. 
and some other sort of really basic ideas that that she was proposing that babies are sort of innately using to as a scaffolding for all other concepts. Whether that's true or not, I think it's still you know an open research question. Um, there there have been a lot of efforts in the past in AI to try try and come up with these primitive, like as you say, the, like transitivity. You know there was a work by uh, Roger Shank of Yale, where he developed this whole language called um, conceptual dependency, I think, uh, that, that was all situations could be uh, described in terms of this language. Uh, it didn't really work out very well because um, I don't, it's hard to boil down everything we know into this set of primitives, I think. In a kind of operational way that you can like, implement it in a machine. So I, I think that that's still an open question. And one of the things that I strongly believe is that AI needs to really look very carefully at cognitive science and things like developmental psychology. And in, I think there's an interaction there that really is going to be quite beneficial. And, you know, we're seeing that with a, a, a lot of uh, different research projects people are engaging in right now. So yeah, there's a lot of open questions in, in cognition, in the science of intelligence that we're going to have to solve, I think, before we can uh, build AI systems that can be this kind of flexible, common sense agents like we are. Yeah, and we spoke with a professor of cognitive computing, J. Mark Bishop, um, some weeks back. And you know, to your point number four, even if there is some innate knowledge, it seems like much more knowledge is really external or externally learned. And he made the point that, look, intelligence is implemented by neurons in a brain, a brain in a body, a body in a society, a society in an environment, environments in a world. And it's that entire system that leads to this emergent uh, knowledge base and learning you know, process concepts that are being created. And, you know, to your point, too, about if we try to manually distill all that into a set of core concepts, then we're going to run into the same kinds of problems that Yan LeCun has pointed out so many times that, well, you're going to get them wrong or they're going to be incomplete. And so you've really got to learn them, but it has to be learned from a much more complex system than just the artifacts that people produce, like all our text on the Internet, for example. Yeah, and it's surprising. I mean, I agree with you, but it's surprising how controversial that is. That this whole notion of the extended mind, as you say, or, or embodiment, or the necessity of, of interacting in this real environment instead of a sort of an artifact like the internet. But that's, it's still not generally accepted that we're going to need that to build generally intelligent systems. Um, so I think that's that's still an argument that's been going on for many, many years. And we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how it plays out. As far as I understood, uh, and I agree with you, you, we have to take a lot of inspiration from our intelligence to build the artificial intelligences. Uh, and I understood so far from your work that uh, you explained uh, very clearly that artificial intelligences we have so far are no human intelligences. How do you think about uh, human intelligences now in, in, in isolation? Like, do you think we are the only way possible to get to intelligence or do you think we're more of an accident and we could arrive at the same kind of solution in a different way and perhaps are we seeing intelligence but not recognizing it that's a great question i you know i i don't know the answer i think it's very possible that there's other ways to get to intelligence um that we are there's a lot of what biologists would call historical contingency that underlies the evolution of human intelligence. And uh, it's not clear at all that that's the only way. Uh, there, so the question is, you know, are we, is there a different kind of intelligence? Maybe, maybe some of these AI systems actually have an intelligence that we're not recognizing. Sure. I, you know, the term intelligence is not very well defined, so we have to do a better job of defining it. But 
you know, people often ask me, why, why focus on human intelligence? Why not just, why not have kind of a different kind of intelligence that's machine intelligence? And I guess there's a couple of answers. One is absolutely. So, for instance, this latest um, breakthrough, if you will, by uh, DeepMind on protein folding, it, it's very un, it's not human like, it's not the way that humans would go about figuring out. Uh, the scientific problem, and that's great. That's like a very great compliment to humans. Uh, I've heard many times that people talk about AlphaGo coming up with these um, plays in Go that are just very unhuman, like no human ever would have thought of them, and yet they're they're brilliant. Humans can recognize that they're they're brilliant only after the fact. So I think that kind of different kind of intelligence can complement our intelligence in certain domains. But in domains where the, the machines have to interact with us in the real world, like self-driving cars, we don't want them to be generalizing in a different way than we do, because then we'll get into accidents. And that's, we've seen that happen, where uh, self-driving cars sort of perceive very differently than we do. And they perceive, like, for instance, that um, a picture of a stop sign on the back of a truck is an actual stop sign and slam on the brakes and cause an accident. And, you know, that's just one example. So I think it's very de dependent. You know, we need machines that think like us, that are that have the kind of human generalizations we make when we're interacting with them, and in this uh, in the real world in, in in everyday sense. But in other cases, we want them to have very complementary kinds of intelligence. Right. So and that's kind of a complex answer. <laughs> No, and it, it makes sense. Another thing, too, is that, of course, there are some of these historical accidental aspects to our intelligence, but 100% of our t intelligence is not a historical accident. And sometimes the fact that there is any accident is used kind of as a really just an excuse to ignore all the rest of how human cognition is implemented. And yet it is the only example of general intelligence that we have. We should highly value the billion years of evolution that went into into producing it and so there there has to be more we can learn than just the single artificial neuron that we've learned so far uh, could, could i just push back on that a tiny bit though because um to leticia's point as well just because we have an example we have an existence proof of intelligence it doesn't necessarily mean that it couldn't be imp improved upon the feature of our intelligence, as Melanie talks about a lot, is, you know, our, our ability to create these beautiful conceptual analogies. But also, if you look at the AlphaFold program, it has some really cool things built into it, like, for example, the ability to um, recognize symmetry and invariance in data. You know, Francois Chollet talks about the kaleidoscope effect and most of the information in the universe is actually the same thing just represented in slightly different ways so there's no reason why in principle we couldn't add those two things together and get an even better intelligence the intelligence we have was um, evolved with very real biological limitations well no I, I don't i don't think anybody would disagree with that and i'll let melanie speak but i think the point i was making is that i don't think we captured all the useful all the utility of human intelligence in 1958 when we created the perceptron and and just tweaked its kind of activation functions, you know, since then. I think, for example, like you brought up Jeff Hawkins, I think a lot of the things he talks about, about looking at sort of the, the sparsity of biological networks and how maybe we need to do more with smaller but more sophisticated networks. I, th I just think there's a tremendous amount more we should learn and not kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater, to use an analogy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think... I, I think there's quite a bit more we can learn from our own uh, intelligence, from neuroscience, from psychology. Uh, and in fact, those fields are still quite incomplete, so they don't, there's a lot more they can learn. Uh, 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 but there, there as, you, uh, as Tim said, that, that, you know, there are things about us that perhaps aren't optimal in some sense, or they're, they're optimal for our, our particular biological niche, but uh, maybe not for the world we live in, the world we're creating. Uh, we see a lot of our cognitive biases are, are hurting us. <laughs> so perhaps machines can help us kind of escape from those biases. However, you know, I, th this is a debate I've had with many different people. That there's this notion that 
you can kind of have it all in a machine. You can have perfect reasoning and uh, creativity and all the good things about our intelligence without any of the bad things, uh, without any of the biases, sort of pure intelligence. And I'm not convinced at all that that's possible. You know? well. People like, uh, you know, Stuart Russell kind of feel that you can build this super intelligent system without any of our biases or sort of common sense, <laughs> and therefore they pose risks. Uh, but I'm not convinced that we can separate these things so easily. Well, could I touch on that? Because we did actually have a question lined up on pure intelligence, so I should ask that now. We spoke to Jeff Hawkins last week. I'm sure you were, you were aware of his work. And he thinks that if only we modeled the general learning algorithm of the neocortex with the, you know, without the neuroses of the primitive monkey brain that we have underneath, that we could create a utopian and pure form of intelligence, one which wouldn't want to kill us and one which wouldn't suffer itself if, if, we, if we turned it off. And um, analogously, GoFi people think that we should forget about the brain entirely and implement the mind directly using a typical programming language. Um, you know, that simple computational primitives can be composed together to create a pure, although still possibly emergent intelligence. Do, do you think there's, there's any, anything there at all? I think we don't understand enough about intelligence to really say that, that such a thing would be possible. There's absolutely no evidence in my mind that you could do this, that kind of separation, that those the constraints, you know, that you have all these, uh, that you could kind of skim off this perfect intelligence. I think a lot of our intelligence comes from our embeddedness in a social world. We're extremely social species. A lot of things that we consider to be sort of pure reasoning are really actually, uh, tools we use in, 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 in the um, goal of improving our social standing or, you know, there's all kinds of uh, reasons that we do the things that we do. And, and I'm not sure you can separate out this sort of pure intelligence, this, you know, what Newell and Simon called this physical symbol system of intelligence that doesn't rely on the brain or if you're, you know, talking to Jeff Hawkins, the the, the sort of primitive uh, parts of the brain, or uh, the body, or the embeddedness of the body in the world. So that's my stance. I, you know, I don't think anybody knows the answer just because we don't understand these things well enough. One reason, but I have to really think more about that. But one reason why I don't think this absolute awesome <laughs> biasless intelligence is possible is perhaps the second law of thermodynamics. So um, I'm always I'm always surprised about the surprise in the community when it comes to adversarial examples and unrobust features and so on, because um, you know, physics teaches us that uh, natural things like to minimize energy. They like to go the easy, the short, in other words, the lazy way. So, um, what I don't understand, why should these, uh, you know, poor networks that we have right now invest the energy and, you know, go this extra mile to learn the robust features or the features we want and we think are right when everything we do is to give it a limited data set with a limited objective function. Um, so my question is, um, could we humans ever define or have an expectancy about the right features? Aren't we, um, you know, making AI dirty just by the fact that we are programming it and we are ma making it serve us or make it useful for us? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's possible that we, we, you know, we're giving it the goal, the goal. We're saying, you know, learn, learn this particular task. Uh, here's some data to learn it from. Go, go, go for it, you know, the, the minimize your loss function. That is a, that is, that's the, you know, calling that learning is another one of these wishful mnemonics. I think that that learning in, in 
humans and other animals is just very different from that. It's not, it's not this passive absorption of, of examples labeled, you know, or not, um, that it, it's much more active, it's more social, it's more um, contextual, it's more self-motivated. And we learn in a very complex world. So I think all of those things uh, are very different from what machine learning is all about. And, and machine learning is just set up to, as you say, just learn whatever the easiest path is towards minimizing the, the objective, the, the loss function, given the data. And that will lead to shortcuts that uh, are not robust. I wanted to ask you, Melanie, in, in your opinion, when does a system do abstraction? Now, um, we kind of need a test that this is happening. And it might sound like a trivial question, because I know you could just say, well, it's the information conversion ratio or the ability to deal with novelty. But having been inspired by your writing and also Hofstadter's Surfaces and Essences, you also wrote a, a paper called The Core of Cognition, which we'll talk about in a sec. But um, I, I watched a video by Hofstadter, actually. He said that um, analogies were a bit like the interstate freeway of the brain which I thought was wonderful. But uh, could you add a bit more flavor to what exactly you mean by abstraction? Yeah, so so abstraction, I think of it as kind of a continuum. So I, you know, we talk about classification or categorization. That That's kind of a form of abstraction when I see two examples of a category, uh, like, you know, um, uh, uh, I, 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 I see two two different dogs, and then I categorize the, the whole thing as dog. I'm kind of making an abstraction. I'm moving away from the details of a specific instance. But you can abstract even further. You know, I, in my paper, I use the example of a bridge. You know, we we think about bridges, the, the, the Golden Gate Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge, and um, but we ex, ex, we can abstract that into um, things like a bridge, a, a bridging the gender gap, or uh, Joe Biden said he was a bridge to a new generation of leaders. And, you know, we say these kinds of things all the time. We use them more metaphorically, but we don't even notice that it's a metaphor because concepts are sort of on this continuum of, of being extremely uh, concrete and individualistic to being more and more abstract and metaphorical. So I think of it as kind of a continuum. And that's really I, what makes us so flexible is our ability to kind of move so fluidly along this continuum. It, exactly. And, and that's why, in a way, I feel that there's something special about the structure of the human brain. Again, Jeff Hawkins was talking about um, reference frames essentially but so we when we're thinking we're traversing reference frames and we have a very associative brain and in the core of cognition paper um Hofstadter was talking about the word shadow um it, it's a it's a really interesting word isn't it because you could say i'm in the shadow of my mother or um a tree shadow if the snow fell on the tree and underneath the tree was was a shadow so um yeah he says it's a blurry region in semantic space as is any human category, because the subtleties of mapping situations onto other situations, the very human faculty of, a, of analogy making, he says, is that, you know, the concept is a package of, of analogies. Uh, so his core idea of the apparatus of thinking is that um, it's a series of leaps involving high level perception, activation of concepts and long term memory, transfer to short term memory, and then partial and context dependent unpacking of chunks and then further high level perception. And he says that his ideas are significantly different from pure associativism. Uh, which I suppose you would say Jeff Hawkins is, is, a, is a fan of that. And, and his focus is on the transport between the long-term memory and the short-term memory and how it's unpacked and processed. So the thing is, as you were saying before, cognitive scientists have some really interesting and divergent ideas about what cognition really is. And when we spoke to Gary Marcus the other week, he had a, a, another, you know, another different view on it. Um, we don't really seem to be having this conversation with cognitive scientists at all in the AI world, do we? I think it's it, it it's happening more and more. So when I went into AI, and I started graduate school in the mid '80s, uh, 
there was a lot of interaction. There was this notion that you know, cognitive science was bringing together people from different fields, including AI, that AI was a core part of cognitive science. AI in the 90s, I mean, it became machine learning, essentially, and be, went off in this direction more of statistics and statistical learning and further away from cognitive science. And so, but I think now people are realizing the limitations of these purely statistical approaches. And a, a lot of people are now coming back to thinking about intersections with uh, cognitive science, uh, even you know the, the, the pioneers of deep learning like uh, Yoshio Bengio, thinking a lot about the ideas from from psychology and uh, you know I, ideas from uh, say uh, Daniel Kahneman. Bengio talks a lot about system one, system two, etc. Uh, so there's more and more interaction, which is a good thing. Uh, I think uh, there's it's still at the forefront of research is trying to incorporate a lot of these ideas from cognitive science into, into AI. And, you know, even like people like Francois Cholet, who you talk to, talks a lot about developmental psychology and ideas from people like Spelke and, and, and others about core knowledge. So that, that's a good thing, right? So I, I'm, I'm optimistic now about sort of making new progress in the field. Yeah, but I mean, just as a quick follow-up, I think you're right, actually. Gary Marcus said that Yoshio Bengio basically introduces his talks now with some of the stuff that he was saying two years ago. And and as you say, the, the recognition from Jan LeCun that common sense knowledge is the dark matter of the universe. And as you say, the, the spell key work as well, cited by Cholet. So maybe you're yeah. right, actually. Maybe there has been a real move in that direction. And apart from cognitive science, you have been in this field for a long time. I think that's uh, the m most awesome thing uh, when somebody uh, as young as me speaks to you. Uh, what are the things back then that you as a field knew better when doing research? And what are the things you mm, forgot that were good? And also the other way around, what are the cool things we have now that weren't there back then? Yeah. Well, okay, so, you know, uh, what, back then, of course, people, I think, were more, in a way, more open-minded about what approaches were worth following. I felt, I feel like the field was more diverse. You know, right now, AI, the, the field only has a, a small number of sort of top-tier conference venues that people go to. And they're all really very much focused on deep learning. Um, there, it's not easy to uh, publish on other kinds of approaches in these venues. Uh, the field kind kind of lost diversity in in ideas. You know, not to mention other kinds of diversity. But um, I, I I feel like that that's something that a lot of people are saying. Uh, we need more new ideas. We need more, more, maybe some ideas that people were actually investigating 20 years ago, maybe should be coming back. So, you know, one of those ideas, I've worked on a few different areas, like my work with Hofstadter on analogy. I think that's something that could, is poised for a comeback. Also, people are now paying more attention to things like evolutionary computations or ideas from evolution and, and, and instead of just this, you know, deep neural networks. So I do think there's going to be a lot more diversity coming into the field as more and more people realize that there are limitations of the current set of approaches. And how long would you estimate that it will take until people wake up? Or do you see already that people are waking up? I guess so, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I see people are waking up. You know, for example, uh, I saw a, a job ad for uh, the Google Brain team for somebody in like artificial life, uh, genetic algorithms, uh, these kinds, you know, cellular automata, these kinds of ideas that we haven't seen in in. in like these big companies that are doing research in AI, that, that they're kind of opening up to people outside the field of deep learning, which is 
which is a promising thing. So I think it's good, it's happening already. So, um, Melanie, I wanted to ask you about the nature of knowledge representation and why exactly GoFi was seen as brittle. So um, I feel that you got pretty close to the center of the bullseye in your book when you said that most of the common sense knowledge that we have is experiential, ineffable, multimodal, and not accessible in any structured form anywhere on the internet. And GoFi people would argue blind that knowledge about the world, like facts and events and mathematics, etc., is absolute. As we were saying before, you know, it would exist um, to a certain, you know, in some cases, even if the universe didn't uh, e exist. And um, they think that knowledge must be acquired, not learned, and can only be succinctly described using symbols and relations, which in plain language means something a bit like a mind map or a, or a network diagram. But intuitively, much of the um, other experiential common sense core knowledge we possess cannot be described in this way. You know, a lot of our sensory everyday um, uh, knowledge. Now, um, GoFi people also cite Marvin Minsky's Society of Mind, where he projects an apparently brittle, modular architecture of the mind, disregarding the strong associativity and compositionality of our own brains. And you said in your book that the deep learning driven computer vision boom has apparently stalled a bit recently, some years after the heady highs of Alex Krzyzewski's ImageNet moment in 2012. The performance on harder challenges like object recognition weren't quite as successful. And the realization has set in that visual intelligence is not easily separable from the rest of intelligence, especially general knowledge, abstraction, and language. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I think that says it all. That that this idea that we we have uh, visual, you know, visual intelligence, language intelligence, etc. It, I think is an artificial separation that you can actually. Um, Say separate our ability to to understand language from our ability to uh, make sense of visual or other sensory data, uh, and uh, that's something that people in uh, cer certainly in GoFi felt we could do, but we still see it. Um, and I think you know if you ask people in the field, they they sort of agree. They'll agree, yes, absolutely, but but it's hard to figure out what to do about it. You know, how do we do, how do we even start? Um, so I think that, you know, that there, there's this interesting program now at, at DARPA, which is, uh, you know, one of the bigger funders of AI in the U S on called uh, foundations of machine common sense, where, where they're bringing together AI people with, with developmental psychologists to kind of, try and recapitulate development between zero and 18 months for human infants uh, to say that that's really, that's kind of the key is to figure out how babies actually acquire the knowledge that they need to, to scaffold everything else. Um, whether that will succeed, I don't know, but it's, it's a, it's an interesting approach. So I, uh... You mentioned earlier the analogy um, analogy work that you did, say like the copycat, for example. And I was I was reading over those papers again recently in prep for this. And what I loved was in the in the very beginning of say the the chapter five uh, work that you did in the 1995 book. It says something like, "This is not connectionist. It's not symbolic. Uh, it's somewhere in between. Maybe some people would call that hybrid, though we didn't set out to build." A hybrid system. What I'm wondering is, is today, say, you know, more than 20 years later, if you've kind of thought about that again in the context of what's happening right now with transformers and attention, because your work there had kind of an attention mechanism. You know, there would be these um, concepts and the different agents could pay attention to more of the other. And there was an offsetting, uh, you know, happiness factor that tried to kind of rein in the attention mechanism. I'm wondering, like, where you think the, some of the ideas, at least, that were in copycat, where they stand in relation to what's around today, either with Transformers or Omniglot or Dreamcoder, and what you think would be some really promising ideas to salvage and maybe refine a bit um, to, to reuse now. So one of the big differences with things like Transformers and I think neural nets in general is the idea of dynamics, that that perception is this dynamical unfolding 
of a process that occurs in time, with feedback, you know, at every step, continual feedback. So when we were looking at analogy and, and what Hofstadter called high level perception, which means sort of looking at a situation and applying the concepts that we have to that particular situation, whether it be in the mind's eye or a real situation, um, that happened over time and that there were agents that would interact with each other in this temporal way. Transformers, in fact, are the opposite of that. Transformers uh, and the attention mechanism for that is kind of a, a way to take away the, the, the idea of temporal feedback and do everything all at once. You know, it's like Transformers uh, were, were a way to get deal with sort of long range dependencies and data without having to do sort of this recurrent, recurrent uh, processing that you would get like in that LSTM or something like that. And then show you could do it without all that recurrent, which is convenient, but I think it misses the whole dynamics of perception. So that's, the, that's one of the main differences that um, I see. Right. And even the recurrent neural networks don't, you know, are, are only very, mildly recurrent, if you will. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, one thing that we see in, in the human brain and other mammals is that, that, like, there's a huge amount of feedback. And there's a, a very important aspect of temporal feedback over a period, you know, of maybe milliseconds in perception, but it's like some a lot of stuff is happening that you can't capture in a sort of static um, static system that looks at all the data at once. Right. And we've, we've kind of made that point several times on the show, which is that no, no matter how you spin it, you know, almost all of the neural networks that people work on today are equivalent to a fixed depth unrolled, you know, network of some kind. And so they completely lack this iterative, open-ended kind of capability to compute really. And, if you try to add that in, they become impossible to optimize. It's like now we can no longer learn because now we have this open-ended sort of iteration. And, you know, somebody was challenging, well, yeah, but we can just make them really, really deep and, and then it'll be okay. And I said, well, I mean, imagine Andrew Weil and his attic trying to figure out Fermat's last theorem. Like how many iterations did he need to go through kind of computationally in order to achieve that? And so what you're saying is that that dynamic process, really the, the computational temporal iteration is what's missing. It's one of the big missing components of deep learning today. Um, I think that's fair. And if that is the case, what do you think the most promising approach for trying to fold that back into deep learning, if possible, might be? I'm not sure you can fold it into deep learning. Um, I mean, whatever, you know, deep learning is a term that changes its meaning all the time, but <laughs> uh, I think it's possible that that something like a deep neural network could be part of a overall architecture that has this kind of temporal dynamic quality. I, you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned DreamCoder, uh, which is a system I, I'm familiar with, uh, mm -hmm. which is a very different approach it's using uh, what's called probabilistic program induction. That is trying to, given an input, trying to generate a program, a computer program in some language that can um, sort of uh, conceptualize the input. Like you say, an omniglot, which was, was a set of uh, handwritten uh, characters in different languages. Uh, trying to conceptualize those, to abstract them. But that, again, uh, it, it, that was not a system that had a particular input and had this sort of dynamic, iterative feedback, uh, perceptual approach to making sense of the system. It was more like, let's search the possibility of all programs that, in some intelligent way. Hmm. But, um, so I think these, all of these systems, are have some useful ideas in them uh but but we haven't figured out yet how to take all of the the parts and put them together in some coherent 
architecture. And that that's something that, you know, we tried to do with the copycat program, but it had a lot of limitations. It didn't learn. And it was only, you know, it had a very limited sort of micro world that it was working in. So one of the things I'm working on is how do we sort of extend all that, those ideas? Yeah, I mean, on, on the subject of having these, because I know, you, again, you said in your book, Melanie, that the brain has many more feedback connections than feed forward connections, even though we don't entirely understand why. And when we spoke to Jeff Hawkins and, and Nementa, they are one of the only companies that were genuinely trying to do this. They created an HTM algorithm and they, they actually created this kind of cyclical processing. And there are some, um, you know, biologically inspired approaches to neural networks, modeling the temporal binding circuits, the temporal dynamics and so on. But the, the problem is, I mean, even then, let, let's say that you could do this. Maybe some magic will emerge and we'll get to emergence later. But the problem is you, you lose the computation advantage of having these deep learning models because if they are just monolithic matrices and you can just do stochastic gradient descent and you can parallelize it um, all sorts of magic happens but if you directly implement the kind of feedback mechanism that we're talking about it, it's just as intractable as doing the discrete program search that, that uh, Tannenbaum's group is doing sure that's that's absolutely right and and that's that's like the big problem is how how do you do this in a tractable way? So this is where sort of the symbolic AI comes in because this, using symbols as opposed to say neurons uh, it enables the system to be more tractable. But it also co you know comes with this brittleness. So so you really need to figure out how to kind of get these emergent symbols that do make the computation more tractable w without having to, um, uh, without, but, but still maintaining the, the sort of flexibility of this more sub-symbolic sub architecture. And yeah, no one knows how to do that. That's, that's the big problem. What are your thoughts on the neurosymbolic camp of, of folks and what they're up to? Any promise there? Yeah, that, so that's, I, you know, that's a lot of different, that's an umbrella term for a lot of different efforts. I think that there's some interesting ideas there. You know, Dream Coder itself was a neuro-symbolic system in that it, it had a symbolic aspect, which was the program induction, but it also had the neuro aspect, which was the sort of search, using neural networks to assist in search, sort of in a similar way to what, um, say, AlphaGo does where uh, there's this kind of symbolic structure of the tree search and the neural network helps in figuring out how to sort of intelligently or use intuition to search the tree. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's a you know, interesting idea. And I've actually thought about how to incorporate something like neural networks in, in this sort of copycat-like architecture and we, we built a, a system that did, did a little bit of that for visual analogies. Um, but it's still, you know, it's, it's how to do that in a tractable way is, is still, still a challenge. Because I'm, I'm a little bit allergic to this kind of hybrid notation. Because let's say a graph neural network is still very much a connectionist model. It's a, it's, a, it's projecting some kind of dis, you know, let's say topology into a vector space, and something like Dream Coder is still very much discrete first. So, I mean, Copycat, for example, that was a really interesting combination, wasn't it? It was kind of discrete first, but then you had these connection weights right between the letters, a little bit like a um, you know like an adjacency matrix or something. So would you describe that as a connectionist model? Presumably not. Yeah, I don't, you know, it didn't really fit into any existing category because it, it used a very symbolic kind of semantic network, if you will, of concepts uh, that, but that were applied in a much, a, a, a kind of a, using continuous probabilities and, and, and lot, lots of sort of more continuous values, aspects to it. So I would say copycat was, I don't, you know, it's hard to 
judge, but it's, it was more symbolic than connectionist, but it had elements of both, and it had elements of probabilistic reasoning as well. Uh, so I don't know. It wasn't it wasn't easy to to categorize. I don't know if you call it a neurosymbolic or hybrid or what, whatever. So it, it yeah. So that was one of the problems. It was hard to people would ask you know submit papers to conferences. And they're like what what is this? Is it connectionist? Is it symbolic? Is it go five? <laughs> well, not really. None of the above. You need a new word. It's going to be a Franken AI or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm just I'm not sure if it's composable because if you do project symbols into a vector space, it's irreversible and it's undecidable, and you seem to lose the benefits that you did have before with the symbols. But um, can can we get to emergence quickly? So um, language and consciousness seem to be emergent. Society, money, and politics seem to be emergent. Simple rules like in Conway's Game of Life can produce incredible emergent behavior. And you remember before we were saying that go five people implement the mind and connectionists implement the brain. So there's there's like a ladder of um, emergence, isn't there? And do you have any view on because I, I guess maybe the higher up in the ladder you implement something, the more complexity there is. But there seems to be more con concreteness to the implementation. So do you have any views on where in the ladder we should be implementing AI? Oh, so uh, <laughs> there's a lot of things to unpack there. <laughs> so I'm not sure. If, yeah, there, there's there's a strict ladder here. So uh, I guess what you're asking is, you know, we have sort of symbolic AI, which ignores everything, all of the levels below, like neurons or neural assemblies or all the structures that Jeff Hawkins might consider essential. And then there's kind of the intermediate things like connectionists, you know, I wouldn't say they implement the brain exactly, but they, they implement some, something that's maybe a little more, little more brain like, but connectionists, you know, whatever the, those nodes happen to be, they can represent con, you know, symbolic concepts. Uh, we saw that a lot in connectionism. Then there's like, vector, like deep learning today, which everything's embedded in, in, in these high dimensional vectors um, where you can't really interpret them very well. So you're sort of saying like, where, where should we be on that kind of spectrum? Yeah, I mean, because I'd ask, I could ask a follow up question, which I which I think adds a bit of flavor as well. But I think a lot of this comes down to, again, it, it's levels of abstraction of computational representation. So GoFi people, there are professors like uh, Krishna Swami who think that symbols and functions and relations are the universal primitives of computation. And then um, there are people like Scott Aronson who think that computation is much lower level than that. And this debate can be summed up as the theory of programming versus the theory of computation. Uh, there's actually a great article on it that I can link in the description. But there does seem to be something really important here, because in your Neurips talk, and Cholet's too, for that matter, you were speaking about program synthesis and what Cholet calls type 2 extrapolation. And there seems to be an acknowledgement that we need to have type 1 extrapolation using um, some lower level computational primitives. So it might be a neural network, for example. But in both regimes, the code would soon become completely opaque to human understanding. So which computational primitive or primitive should we be using to build AI? Should it be type 1 or, or type 2? Or should they be enmeshed together, as Cholet argued for? And perhaps it is possible to implement a mind in Python, but would any human understand the code? Oh, probably not. Uh, you know, although the code, if it was a mind, the code would be able to explain itself in the way that we explain our thoughts. And those <laughs> explanations would be flawed <laughs> because it wouldn't have insight into what it's, you know, how, how its mind is actually operating. So I think um, there may be some you know, general trade-off, laws of trade-off between uh, explanation and, and the ability to understand the code and its sort of expressiveness. <laughs> you know, we can look, and, and that doesn't mean the code has to be complex necessarily, because you point out like the game of life, incredibly simple code, and yet it can give rise to arbitrarily complex structures. Um, 
and I think the same is true for our brains, probably there's some relatively simple quote unquote code underlying this, but it's out of this simple code can emerge a lot of complexity, you know. So I don't know the answer. I think that's <laughs> it's a hard question. You know, and, and even and a lot of people would say the question's just even just wrong headed because you're talking about computational primitives. And maybe computation itself is just the wrong metaphor to think about how, how the brain or the mind works. And that's, you know, it's, it's a metaphor. It's not, it, 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 like anything else in, in our discussion of the brain, we use all these metaphors that guide us in certain ways. And for the last, you know, uh, I don't know, 70 years or so, we've used computation and we've said the brain is, uh, computer. And that leads us to think about things like representations and uh, memory <laughs> and other kinds of computer-like things that um, maybe is the wrong way to think about it. I think you're absolutely right, actually, because we had Professor Mark Bishop on and, he, and his thesis is that computationalism is wrong because it would, I don't want to get into the details of his argument, but it would imply that there were an infinitude of conscious experiences um, you know, even in even in the shirt that I'm that I'm wearing, I, I suppose it would lead to panpsychism. But can I ask a fun? Just, just I just got one fun question about because earlier uh, I didn't get to my internet was gone when we were talking about the adversarial examples. But you know, in in the uh, book that that Hostetter edited, uh, Mind's Eye, which I really enjoyed, Mind's Eye, one of my favorite short stories in there is the riddle of the universe and its solution. And essentially, it was about an adversarial example for the human mind where there was something that when displayed on a computer screen would cause the human mind to just crash. And anybody who <laughs> saw that would crash. And so it starts off with a grad student crashes and is stuck at the computer for days. And, and then the people responding to it, they crash. And eventually it, it becomes known like what's happening, but nobody can look at the screen because they'll crash. And <laughs> I just, you know, I thought that was kind of a funny example, you know, but the human mind so far doesn't really seem to be that vulnerable to, uh, to those kinds of adversarial examples, at least not to crash, but we certainly fall for them in other contexts, right? Like various illusions and, and things like that. I wonder if you just see any connection there between what machine learned systems do and the human mind. Yeah, that reminds me of the Monty Python episode, the funniest joke ever that, that like people, it's so funny that people, it's like people just fall down laughing and you can use it as a weapon in war. and the soldiers on the other side are wearing like earplugs so they can't hear it. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so, so, so adversarial examples are, you know, you could say kind of metaphorically, there's adversarial examples for, for humans and illusions or our cognitive biases kind of make us vulnerable to adversarial examples and things like advertisers take advantage of that to kind of manipulate us that um, we're, we're very easily manipulable, manip manipulatable. Uh, th those are a little bit different in uh, quality from the kinds of adversarial examples that fool machines, because those are examples that would never fool a human. Uh, like, you know, looking at a school bus, changing a few pixels, and then thinking that it's an ostrich. But um, sure, any I think any kind of intelligent system is probably going to be vulnerable to some kind of adversarial example. That's probably some provable thing somehow that, you know, there's no way to build a system, a, an intelligent system that isn't vulnerable to some, something like that. Um, but the, 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 the adversarial examples at full machines really show what they show to me is that they're not using the same kinds of features to make decisions that we use. They're using something else. Hmm. And that's something that's important for how we think about their reliability, generability, and so on. I mean, this gets us on to the shortcut rule, actually, because um, in your NeurIPS talk, you spoke about Raven's progressive matrices and the idea that they're highly correlated with um, human intelligence. And there have been several papers recently applying them, uh, applying deep learning to them. But you pointed out that one particular paper, there was a bias on the way that the 
um, the matrices were were projected. And when the bias was removed, the performance fell right down and was nowhere anywhere near as good as, as human performance. But even without the bias, though, there might have been other potential statistical shortcuts. And uh, Guillaume Lample's work springs to mind because he did this symbro- uh, symbolic integration paper. And that seemed to do very well as well. But there's always the question with deep learning that, you know, my goodness, is it just learning some statistical regularities and it's not really doing it the way we want to do it? And then we have a whole field of interpretable machine learning. But it turns out that that's not particularly good at helping us understand how deep learning models work either, because in various ways they might linearize or give us a kind of a looking glass into one aspect of the neural network, but not be particularly salient in helping us understand and, um, you know, Cholet mentioned the shortcut rule in his talk, didn't he? But it, it's it's essentially this thing that the neural network doesn't do it the way that we want it to do it or the way that humans would do it in respect of, of the same task. And you said as well that um, Eric Horvitz, you know, the Microsoft research director, he said that deep learning is a bit like alchemy. I don't really know what we can do to fix this problem. But do you have any ideas? Right. So, so one of the problems... I think is that machine learning systems today rely on large numbers of examples. So it's possible to learn these statistical kind of shortcuts, even because any you know it's it's I think it's impossible to get rid of statistical shortcuts in any da- data set. They're always going to be there. Uh, but if you rely on what people call few shot learning, you can't learn them. It's, it's just not possible because you don't have enough examples. But today's neural networks uh, like rely on these uh, la- large numbers of examples. So the Ravens problem, for example, people, what, these, these are like these little IQ tests, visual problems, where a human isn't trained specifically to do these problems. We, come, you know, our training is life. We, we live in the world. We learn to abstract, and then we were given these little tests to test our abstraction abilities. Whereas the, the paradigm in machine learning is that they they generate automatically thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of these problems, then train the machine on a large number of them, and that. The problem with that is then the machine can learn shortcuts. But if you do it the way that humans are, you just show them a few examples, they can't learn shortcuts. And that I think that was one of the, the motivations for Cholet's uh, ARC uh, corpus, his abstraction and reasoning corpus, was really few shot learning. That, that I'll give you three examples. Now you solve the, 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 a, a similar problem. So you, you can't learn shortcuts. You have to learn the, the concept that that that's the sort of abstract concept there. So I think that's one of the main problems. Another problem that that's more of like the way we measure the systems is that we tend to, to rely on measures of accuracy. Hmm. How many did it get right? Well, that's not a very good measure if there's a shortcut because you know your test set that you're evaluating on has the same statistical uh, correlations as your training set. So the accuracy doesn't measure really the generalization. So we have to come up with better metrics of, of robustness and generality and so forth. So that's that's my thought on that. Although you, you did say on the ARC challenge that the winning solution didn't actually generalize very well to other problems. And it's, right, it's quite winning, a simple domain. The, yeah. the winning solution only got like 20, 20%. 20 or 25% right. Yeah. So it's, you know, to, to really general, and I, I, you know, it's possible the ARC challenge uh, has, we don't want, we shouldn't measure only on accuracy, which is what that measure was, that the ARC challenge needs some better metrics of success. Yeah, and I think we're a little in a contradictory position where we expect uh, or we want the models to have the features in the same way as we do, but we also want superhuman intelligence uh, to be able to do things we cannot do. And to do superhuman things, they have to have also superhuman features. And um, 
I, I'm a little undecided whether we're calling things like shortcuts and, um, you know, we, we say it's the model is cheating us because it's not doing what we want it to do. Uh, what if we're not a little unfair against the model? And what I'm interested in asking is whether, uh, so if you, if I give you a model that uh, solves anything you want, I give you a self-driving car. And you know that that car, because I tell you, look, those features that that AI is using are not human-like at all. But that self-driving car is absolutely super robust. It's giving you 100% accuracy on everything you wanted. It doesn't crash. But you know, it's not solving the task for the right reasons. Would you try harder to make it uh, solve the task for the right reasons? Or would you leave it at that? <laughs> so I think that that's the situation we are in now. That 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 you know these so self-driving cars do well on their uh, evaluations. They can recognize stop signs, yield signs, and speed limit signs just fine on their evaluations. But then they run into these weird new situations that weren't, that are like out of their training distribution, if you will. And they fail because they were never evaluated on that kind of thing. Um, so I guess the question is when you say 100% right for the wrong reasons, how do we know that that's going to generalize? Uh, and this is, I think, something that the, say the, the autonomous vehicle uh, industry is grappling with. How, you know, how do you, how do, you do quality control? <laughs> How do you do verification for these systems that are based on deep learning? Um, how do you know how they're going to uh, perform in new situations? So if they're doing, if they're doing their task, they're making decisions with the sort of the wrong features, they're probably not going to be able to generalize as well as we do in all cases. And everything that they're going to encounter. But do we generalize? Well, I mean, humans do dumb things all the time, like mistake the gas pedal for the um, for the brake pedal. Yeah, so humans are not great drivers, as we all know. Um, uh, but they're not great drivers for different reasons than uh, self-driving cars. And so that's, you know, you might say, well, and people do say, like, well, humans are terrible. They get into all kinds of accidents. So we should trust these systems. They're going to save lives. But it's hard to trust them if we don't understand how they're making their decisions, right? So it, it, it's, and that's the same thing in, like, medical applications of AI. Okay. If we don't understand how they're making their decisions, how can we really trust them? It seems like self-driving, the self-driving problem is sort of like the Patrick Wins. I think he said it was Winskin or, or Minsky with the uh, computer vision all over again, which is, you know, Elon Musk has finally admitted self-driving cars is a hard problem. You know, this was over a different time scale than the little vision activity. Right. Yeah. I, I thought it was amazing. Like right after I uh, wrote my paper, why AI is harder than we think, Elon Musk came out with a, on Twitter saying, gee, self-driving is harder than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, on, on the point about the the errors that we make, and maybe I'm, I'm sure our neurons do make lots of errors, if you do believe, as Hawkins does, that our brain is um, a kind of, you know, lots of voting between different prediction models, I think it's the strong multimodality and embodiment and interaction with our environment that creates the flexibility and, and robustness. So a lot of our um, real intelligence is, is emergent, but it's based on some very faulty underpinnings. But um, my, my final question to you, Melanie, is, is about the illusion of intelligence and the impossibility of creating it. You said in your book that people were convinced in the 1960s that solving chess would require real intelligence. And then there's this thing called the McCorduck effect, which is that every time we make a breakthrough in artificial intelligence, there's a chorus of people that say, that's not really intelligence. And Cholet in particular points out that infinite priors and experience do not an intelligence make. I think that humans have an aversion to intelligence becoming transactional and it being disentangled from feeling and embodiment. And as a thought experiment, imagine we had a supercomputer that can compute everything instantly, right? We could simulate the entire universe and perform a tree search through it. 
but it wouldn't actually be that simple, would it? As Hofstadter said, what constitutes a state? Um, situations in the world don't come nicely framed. Situations have no boundaries. You don't know what's inside the boundary and what's outside the boundary. Uh, Professor Carl Friston, who we had on the show, he had a similar dilemma, which required him um, to, uh, you know, use a rather vague concept of a mathematical, he called it a Markov blanket, yeah, didn't he, um, in his formalism of an intelligent agent. And you said in your book that Andre Kapathy acknowledged this when he said that every single assumption which was made by AlphaGo was violated in the real world. So it's really, really difficult, isn't, isn't it, to create intelligence? Yeah, it's extremely difficult. Uh, I quoted in my book some, somebody, a, a researcher who said that, you know, if, when asked how far are we from general AI, he said we're 100 Nobel Prizes away, which uh, <laughs> is a way of saying that, you know, that many enormous discoveries. So, yeah, it, it's not like AI is, is um, failing. It's that it's a really hard problem, and, and AI has only been around for, you know, less than 100 years, I guess. And, and it, it's not surprising that we haven't solved it yet, because it's a really hard problem. You know, we've got, I think, a lot of this idea, a lot of what AI has done is made us appreciate how hard intelligence is. You know, we, we you know, Minsky had this idea back in the 60s that computer vision, he could assign it to a student. MIT undergraduate over the summer, and they solved it basically. <laughs> um, and then he said, "Well, it was harder than we thought." Uh, <laughs> that's kind of the, the 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 trajectory we've seen, and and things like chess that we used to think maybe required full intelligence, what we consider to be full intelligence. It not only you know changed our idea of chess, but it it, it changed our idea of what intelligence is all about, which we still are grappling. Amazing. Uh, Professor Melanie Mitchell, it's been an absolute honor to have you on the show. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining Thank us. You. Well, thanks. thanks for inviting me. It's been a lot of fun. Okay, so this is the, um, this is the after show debrief. Go for Letizia, it, folks. What do you, what do you think of, uh, of that episode of MLST? I really enjoyed it. And I think we had a wonderful guest, really. And I can see that uh, now MLST has a reputation because every time you're raising the bar with more interesting uh, guests, that's really great. It's quite intimidating, really, to be a <laughs> co-host. Thanks for inviting me. I know, like today we're, we're, we were talking with an icon from a lineage of icons. <laughs> now what? <laughs> Um, no, it was amazing to have Melanie on because she's been such a huge inspiration for me. I've been following her work for so long. And um, she's one of these old school computer scientists. Um, she's a really rare breed, actually. It's um, it's an absolute honor to get people like her on the show because she's just got such a long kind of time horizon to contextualize a lot of her ideas. Yeah. And it's really great that she was a long time in the field because sometimes, I mean, I'm so junior compared to her, right? <laughs> it's obvious, but sometimes I feel that we PhD students of our time are living in a very uh, uncomfortable position uh, in, in this field because there's so much to read that I really wonder when should I even go to the old school stuff? I didn't even <laughs> like finish reading what was out last week. And it's it's a really hard balance to to make. Therefore, you know, having this show that strikes you in the face, like, look, you have to know about these topics. And uh, you had Professor Mark Bishop, and yeah, I mean, literally, he was giving me a reading list for the next ten years, and and that's <laughs> great because in this you know sea of papers, it's a really great pointer to the interesting questions and not to does a batch norm work or not kind right. of questions, but to the most important kind of questions. Well, if I may offer, having been in your shoes a long time ago, if I may mm -hmm. offer some some humble advice, always make room for reading the origin papers, you know, or, or going back to when new ideas were really coming about. Because what's fascinating is, you know, there where they're developing their ideas, they're oftentimes presented um, you know, very, very clearly from, say, prior concepts that you may already be familiar with and you can see the development of the ideas. And then in some rare cases, like, and uh, 
And Melanie's 1995, you know, chapter five and Hofstadter's book is an example of this. You go read it and you think, wow, this is, I could be reading this today. And a lot of the language in there is still relevant and they're very prescient. You know, the same is true of a lot of Gary Marcus's uh, works or, or Yann LeCun or any of them for that matter. So I'd say always carve out a little bit of time, you know, maybe um, 20% at least to go back and, and every once in a while read some of those older or original papers. It's worth it. Yeah, yeah it it's valuable advice. <laughs> the the comment I made at the beginning I, as well, I stand by because I, I, I read so much stuff now to prepare for this show. And there's such an I'm really interested in clear prose and clear communication. I've, I've even started listening to a great podcast called The Writing Guy with Scott Keezer. And, um, you know, he, he talks a lot about using very concise language and preferring the concrete to the abstract. Um, which ironically actually is is saying don't use metaphors and analogies. But um, you, I really noticed the difference. So with Francois Cholet and Gary Marcus and Melanie Mitchell, their, their writing is incredible. And, and I put myself back 10 years when I felt very lost reading a lot of um, the, the, the literature on machine learning. It just felt overwhelming. And someone like Melanie comes along and, and because she understands it deeply, she's she's consolidated her understanding and she can give you very powerful intuitions and she can really give you the context about the entire field. And I guess I'm just thinking if I could go back in time, if I was a little bit smarter about what I read online, I think I would have accelerated my learning quite a lot. So if you find yourself in the situation where do. you just feel lost, probably you're just reading the wrong material. <laughs> it's hard. It's just hard to filter. It's, it's, you really need mentors for that. I mean, having having great advisors and people who can, they've done a lot of the filtering for you. And what's interesting about Melanie's writing is it was great even when she was pretty much just out of her PhD, right? Even without this, this historical perspective she has. So it's just, you know, you got to find good mentors in your field that can guide you to some of the best work. Uh, otherwise, it's just overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we're going a little through a paradigm shift because in term of mentoring because before you if you wanted to study a certain topic there were perhaps two people in this world doing that so you had to travel to let's say London to study exactly that particular topic in linguistics and now it's uh, it's more decentralized now for example let's suppose someone doesn't have a mentor that you know, tells uh, him what to read and what to do, but he has the machine learning street talk pod. I, I know I'm making <laughs> there so you much go. Anyway, advertisement, <laughs> but but that's that's the awesome thing. I uh, because you're not completely lost anymore. I mean, in this sea of new information that is getting out daily, there's also the counterbalance of pointers, and uh, I, that's what I why I think YouTubing is great, and I think that's also the reason why I'm doing it. So, yeah, fantastic. And Another thing as well is I love the pragmatism of, of Melanie and, and Shulay as well, the ability to contextualize. Because in many ways, as she made clear, there hasn't been any progress since 1955 at that, you know, kickoff in, in Dartmouth with uh, Minsky and the other go fired pioneers. There has been some incredible achievements with deep learning, and I, I don't want to diminish those achievements. But as Melanie said, after the deep mind atari paper some other folks came along with a really simple evolutionary algorithm just randomly setting some weights on a convolutional neural network and they beat the deep the deep qn paper so maybe it right. wasn't that intelligent after all right and there's and, the same yeah i'm sorry i didn't mean to talk over you there's the same thing with the uh you know with the dota ai that was playing uh defense of the ancients and then people very quickly figured out how to beat you know the the ai itself and so I think what's happening here is just it's it's really the the um, exact thing she said about Minsky, you know, assigning the computer vision to the the uh, MIT intern for a, a summer project or something. It's just we've made tremendous progress. The problem is we figured out that the, that the goalpost is like a lot further away than we than we thought it was. It's, we were looking at it and we thought it was you know just over the horizon but but actually that was just a reflection of a of a reflection from a different solar system and we got <laughs> we got fooled really by kind of the optical illusion there yeah but all of the things that we find easy are the hardest things in ai that's what melanie said in her paper and that's yeah. so true and all of the hype is telling us that we're making this incredible progress in ai but it's doing things which are actually in fact 
very easy for computers. It's not, I don't think it's a fair comparison. Yeah, I, I kind of learned that as a kid because uh, I, for a little while I was into Rubik's cubes, right? Like solving them on my own and then learning the methods to solve them. And once you learn kind of the method to solve a Rubik's cube, for example, if you give me a Rubik's cube, I'm just always going to follow the same method to solve it. It doesn't really matter how mixed up it is. Even if you just slightly mix it up, like put two blocks out of alignment, rather than try to figure out how to specifically undo that, I'm just going to go through the procedure, right? Whereas for a computer, if it's not programmed to do that, maybe it learned how to do it through machine learning, it'll see the complexity differently. It's like, oh, only these two blocks are mixed up. I have a little shortcut to do that. I don't need to go through the whole procedure. Whereas if it's very mixed up, it has to do more computation. So I think it's just pointing at how humans and machines reason very differently right now. And like Melanie was saying kind of towards at the end there, it's it's really been quite an educational process for us, teaching us not only about machines and how they learn, but inversely, our efforts in machine learning teaching us more about human intelligence and intelligence in general. Yes, and the fact that we see the goalposts now moving so far away in another planet and so on is also... Um, telling us that we do not know enough about us because th this fact that things that are easy for us are hard for computers also means that we are taking for granted the millions of years of evolutions that we have undergone. And I always find it Agreed. fascinating to research in artificial intelligence takes inspiration from cognitive science, but taking inspiration only from what we are now or what we are after the baby is born. So uh, in, in this process of growing up and learning things after we have been thrown out into the world uh, is, is again, saying that we're not, not looking into what happens before we are born and what happens in our evolution as a species and that we, we perhaps will understand intelligence when we really understand biology. But if we, when we look at the state of um, biological research, it becomes quite clear that there the goalpost is very far away. Therefore, I don't expect the, our goalpost to be uh, closer to us. Yeah. And, and what is intelligence? Is, is it, does it have to be this information conversion ratio? Does it have to be sample efficient or could it be more transactional? Yeah, because um, one of the things that really interests me actually is is this idea of being able to create a pure intelligence, like what Jeff Hawkins asked, uh, uh, um, advocated for, or what GoFi people advocate for, and it does make you think that all of the the content that we're creating, you need to be an expert across so many different fields, right? Cognitive science, statistics, machine learning, mathematics. Um, you know, we were talking to uh, Michael Bronstein the other week about group theory, for goodness sake. It, it's it's just mind boggling and the philosophy of mind. Right. And because um, can a pure intelligence exist? And then you start to think about embodiment and you start to think about, um, you know, maybe it's an emergent phenomenon. It, it just it blows my mind. Yeah. Well, and it was kind of, you know, when we were talking to uh, Hawkins and there's the whole sort of is versus ought dilemma, right? And and he was he was kind of saying that, uh, you know, you don't you don't necessarily need any kind of oughts for an intelligence. But on the other hand, let's just say if you just take the standard kind of scientific view of the universe and and leave out some particular metaphysics, we if if we have oughts, human beings have moral oughts, right? This came from inanimate stuff. I mean, we started off as just atoms, right? And through the process of cosmic evolution, biological evolution, we ended up with aughts. So somehow or another, at least physically, you can get to aughts from is, even though philosophers seem to stumble over this all the time, right? So what I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up is that suppose we did create a pure super intelligence. Uh, I'm not convinced that it wouldn't, even in its pure form, develop aughts. You know, it may look out and analyze kind of the what it can observe in the universe and all the atoms and biological things that are around it, and from that arrive at some aughts. Because look, we got here physically, right? And we ended up with aughts. Why can't a pure superintelligence? Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's impossible just from 
an energy perspective, think about what energy consumption would that being intelligence, pure intelligence need to overlook mm -hmm. everything. We even need more research into physics to, to know if there's a tap into infinite energy, because if there's not, I, I don't think <laughs> we could well, pay the energy electricity bill for that. Sure. I mean, it seems like the primordial ought is survival. It's like if, if the if the super intelligence doesn't survive, then it just won't be around. And super intelligence that do survive will be. And so it just brings about, again, the brilliance of Darwin and evolution, which is just the mere requirement of survival almost produces oughts somehow. But where I don't agree with you is the survival aspect. I don't think it's survival itself. I think it's just replication. Because if we look at what's driving living things, I don't think it's survival itself. I mean, of course, there is a um, sense of self-conservation because if you go kill yourself, you're not producing any more offspring. But I think the, the objective of genes is replication and not really surviving. I don't think this intelligence would be necessarily a thing that wants to live forever, but perhaps a thing that knows that it will be able to replicate forever. Yeah, I mean, obviously for for evolution, the concept of evolution to take place, you have to have those, what is it, the four, four kind of components, right? Uh, the ability to pass on information, um, I forget what the other ones are, but but, you know, you might, like you're saying, it may be a combination of things, but I think uh, at the end of the day, there is this basic requirement of the ability to, in some form, have your information continue on, replicate, and that that could lead to, could lead to odds, all kinds of odds mm -hmm. that sort of help achieve that one primordial odd. What do you um, think of that paper by Hofstadter? Oh, you're talking about the, uh, the, uh, his article on analogy is the core of, um, of cognition. Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, I I think I have a lot of sympathy for it. My my issue is usually once I get enough interest in something, I want to see math. Like, okay, I buy into this, but can we somehow formalize this? Like, give me some symbols that I can start to think about. Like, here's the structure that defines what a concept is. This is the, the structure that defines an analogy. This is the mathematical statement I'm talking about, about how you can derive all kinds of other reasoning like syllogisms and whatever else from these structures. I just want to see some math. And a lot of times there's the philosophy piece and then nobody ever produces math. And then I, then I just kind of stop. It's like, okay, I think I agree. It sounds pretty good, but to really agree, I need some, I need some math to start thinking about, you know? Hmm. I mean, one, one thing that did spring to mind is there's something very biologically determined about our intelligence. Our intelligence is a function of our own brain and our own environment and our own, um, you know, all of our senses and the way we interact with the environment and so on. So to a certain extent, even our analogy making is a, is a direct function of our own embodiment and the way that our brain is connected. Who's to say that that is a particularly good form of intelligence? I suppose a good form of intelligence should be one which is flexible in the sense that one you know if you have a brain in a in a what you call it a brain in a vat is that right it, it's completely useless right so would our analogy making and the way our intelligence works is it only anthropocentric or would it make sense if our type of intelligence was in a machine our anthropocentrism is so widespread and that we're so, such i mean because i agree with you but we are such um we're prisoners of our, we're prisoners in our own body. And exactly like you said, and I don't think we would even recognize such an intelligence. It would be intelligence in some weird definition that is not anthropocentric. But what I also understood from the discussion with Melanie Mitchell was that we, we do this for a reason. It, it's for helping us. And if that thing takes off and uh, flies off to uh, another galaxy, that's i mean it could be intelligence but <laughs> that doesn't yeah. help us uh, and i also i'm afraid that really we're not recognizing sometimes intelligence when uh, in where intelligence is due and i 
I mean, it's hard now to give an example and to, to put a threshold and to say dogs are not intelligent, but uh, pff, I don't know, apes are. I, I would say that even dogs are intelligent, but we're so anthropocentric and so prisoners of our own language, even that it's almost sometimes enough to, to call something either intelligent or either not intelligent. And that thing will take then this attribute. Uh, I mean, Throughout history, uh, we have labeled, mislabeled whole races as not that intelligent. And it's absolutely, it's super dangerous that, that hmm. we could do that successfully without anyone budging, uh, or not enough people budging for, for su such a long time. And on, on some aspects we have enlightened, but on other aspects, Every time I see a TikTok video with a dog that does some interesting things, I'm amazed because when I read that, yes, humans are intelligent and we're special, everything else is not that special, but I see dogs do things that I wouldn't have expected ever. So what if uh, we're just mislabeling them? And what if we're doing that with machines all the time? Yeah, and because what's interesting about what you just said is Melanie Mitchell said that there's the is it the first step paradox you know so um, it's a it's a myth to think that intelligence now is on a ladder to real intelligence you know like building a taller tower getting closer to the moon but interestingly with biological intelligence there is a continuum because dogs absolutely are intelligent so that that's kind of interesting but what fascinates me is that because when we talk about the intelligence explosion and so on, you know, Cholet argues that there are limiting forces. There are lots of environmental rate limiting steps to intelligence. But what fascinates me is that our own intelligence is anthropocentric. It's very human-like, but we've also discovered mathematics and we've discovered many right. universal paradigms because a lot of GoFi people, they say that knowledge is universal. We acquire it, we don't learn it. So there's this interesting thing that another form of intelligence could develop but they would also acquire and discover the same paradigmatic primitives as we have done. So in a sense, this emergent layer of stuff we've got on the top is completely disconnected from the intelligence that discovered it. Yeah, I agree with you, which is, so look, I, I mean, none of this is binary. I don't know why people always slip back into kind of binary thinking, but yeah, humans, human beings have all kinds of issues. We have to eat stuff and we produce waste and we, you know, consume oxygen and we hurt other human beings and all kinds of issues. But on the other hand, we understand electrons and positrons and protons and, and neutron stars and we can, you know, create models of, of, uh, parts of the universe that are so far away that, you know, we'll probably never, ever, ever be able to reach them. So we can conceive all these things, right? And we can create things like mathematics that, uh, as far as we know, you know, there's no alternatives. There's just math. I mean, we haven't really discovered like math one and math two, like <laughs> if the universe was slightly different. You know, we would have like math two. Um, and so I think a lot of what human intelligence is and a lot of human knowledge is universal but on the other hand it's not all universal and and the hard part is telling which parts are and aren't universal and as letizia was saying you know we do have these cognitive fallacies where we we oftentimes believe something is much more universal than what it really is it's like one of our friends tim is constantly saying you know like oh you know uh, it was impossible for anybody to believe that the earth was flat like ever well hold on a second you know is the universe flat I don't know. I mean, we, we sort of, we've narrowed it down to a certain, uh, you know, very tiny, tiny, tiny degree of error, but still at the same time, these at one time were open questions and yet there are reasonings that you can apply to it. And so maybe reasoning and logic may be more objective and universal than, than uh, some, some kind of factual knowledge. So I think it's an open question, but I, I would guess that a large portion of human knowledge is universal and not anthropocentric like a hypothetical super intelligence would need to understand electrons and protons and quantum mechanics and whatever else if they wanted to do anything useful in this universe and then lots of the stuff we know is anthropocentric and, and not universal well, well there's a couple of things there just to unpack so some knowledge is universal you can get into a debate about that a lot of philosophers are relativists but let, let's say we're not a relativist. And then okay. 
knowledge, as, as we've previously established, is a justified true belief. Mm -hmm. But then there's the whole world of possibilities before you actually know something is a fact. Then you get into right. this, um, I mean, I would call it a kind of superset of logical reasoning, but um, our friend would massively disagree with us on this. But, sure. you know, before we knew that the earth was round, we could reasonably have believed that right. it was flat. And what, what, what belief is that? Is it 0 0.5? Is it 0 0.1? Right. How do well, you again, reason about that? It's this, yes, knowledge, you know, at least to epistemologist is a justified quote true belief but on the other hand all of those things justification and truth come in degrees it's not zero one the world is not binary like it's very hard to think of things that are even binary you know i know i i like science fiction and and there was this quote that always stuck with me from stargate sg1 which is a tv show which is this supposed ancient race that had you know ancient superior knowledge or whatever they made the statement that the universe is infinite is the only truth, right? And so there, it's almost like saying there are no absolutes except this one absolute, right? Everything else is kind of a matter of degree. Yeah, so then when you're building AI systems, because GoFi people would say knowledge is acquired, it's not learned. You can't, you know, two people can't learn it differently. Again, it's again, binary. I just can't deal in binaries. I'm not, I'm, I'm a I know, but, but then, real number but, guy. But then how do we build, because we, we need common sense knowledge to build AI, right? But, but we have to, we have to learn it progressively. That's what children do. See, the, that's the amazing thing, right? Is that we have this brain, and as Leticia was saying, we have all these little cortical columns and they're all incredibly, um, problematic that they make errors all the time but there's, there's so much redundancy and fault tolerance in our brain that they actually work really resiliently and even though we all learn language and knowledge differently we learn it in the same way in the end right it's absolutely incredible how that happens but are you sure about that i mean have, have you checked that uh, you you learn exactly in the same way as keith does i absolutely love uh, so for me wittgenstein was an absolute revelation when i read him and i just love his analogy to um, uh, so, so he has a little story like everybody walks with a box uh, in his arms and i can look in my box you can look in your box but i cannot look into his box or your box and we we think we're Speaking about the same thing, and we think we have the same thing in our box, and we don't. And of course, there are some arguments for perhaps we have the same thing in our box because if we, you know, open the brain, it's a bunch of neurons, and there might be some variants here and there, but it's uh, you know the same matter. But we we don't actually know but uh, i mean it's not a binary thing as keith says it's oh <laughs> nice it's uh it's not like we are the same or we are not the same we are on a distribution somewhere and we have some deviation from the from the mean yeah and actually um melanie's in some of her writings has, has made this point that you know communication between people is metaphor and it's metaphor in the sense that you have to so in your mind if you're doing this or i'm sorry this was actually in that article by uh hofstadter actually not this wasn't mm -hmm. uh, but she may have said this too but you know if if reasoning has all this analogy built into it then when i want to communicate with you and you've got this different brain and it's going to be different it's at least partially right not zero or one again but it's going to be some percentage different and somehow i have to get my uh, analogy structure that I'm thinking about communicated over into you and it has to be encoded in this kind of language, right? Translated into language over to you and then somehow I have to construct in your mind or cause to be constructed in your mind sufficient analogical structures to recreate what I have. That's a pretty cool thing, isn't it? Like the fact that we can even do that and the fact that it works shows that there has to be some degree of commonality. Um, otherwise, all of us are just not understanding each other. And, you know, we all do have, you can slice open brains and take a look and we have a lot of the same structures. So there's got to be sufficient commonality that mm -hmm. we can be confident we're thinking similar enough, right? 
And I think this is again an evolutionary thing because uh, we can check that we have a common understanding by the fact that we then act. Um, I mean, if you say, let's go, let's record, we all act in the same way on, on this. Uh, we, we react, yeah, right? And this is important for, you know, the survival of a species that people start to act together and do something together. But if uh, again, in the line of thinking of shortcut learning, there is no reason why we should be doing more than that than acting on in the same way well one really, some some yeah one really quick thing here is there's an even simpler way and, and this is actually an important part of debate and sort of the rules of communication is i communicate to you and then you have to communicate back to me and make sure that it survived the double translation right which is why you have these sort of rapapores rules and whatever where you know, you don't argue with somebody until you can restate their position and they agree that you've accurately restated their their position. So we just do this back mm -hmm. and forth and make sure that the translations are working properly. And so much goes off the rails when people don't take the time to do that. Like uh, this happens yeah. to Tim and I all the time. Like we're in a hurry and some some discord messages go back and forth. And pretty soon we're not even talking about the same things anymore to each other. But isn't it fascinating that we can actually have this common understanding at all? Because intelligence is the absence of brittleness, basically. Because our, our, our brains are just taking in hundreds of thousands of little signals from different parts of our bodies. They're, they're just little sensor predictions, if you believe Jeff Hawkins. And all of this stuff happens on the top. So now on the top, we have this very robust understanding when we all say, let's do this, let's press the record button. And also another interesting thing, as the symbolists will say, is that most of the knowledge we have, the common sense knowledge, is acquired through deduction and instruction rather than sensory experience. So we, we are communicating with each other now through instruction and we're communicating knowledge which we both have a common understanding of and much of that knowledge is based on metaphors analogy or some kind mm -hmm. of experience we've had in the world but we've managed to create an abstract category which robustly lines up in our theory of in our kind of call it theory of mind it's it's unbelievable yeah, but what I uh, I think about here is there's shortcut. This is a matter of shortcut learning in evolution because um, we always say, oh, deep learning network are, are doing are taking shortcuts and are you know lazy and so on. But I think evolution does exactly the same thing because what would be the ideal communication? It would be like in this Avatar movie when they connect their, those <laughs> hair or, or I don't know what they have. They they connect and they are really connected and c communicate truly and so on but that didn't happen and evolution uh, was lazy here we what we did was bare minimum such that if you say let's uh, take down this lion we do so together and uh, we have a strategy and can implement it but it it's shortcut learning all the way uh, <laughs> right <laughs> well it, it it is it is but the over kind of uh, spread on top of us is the fact that we had evolution happening to us. And so that's this weird sort of external process that's doing all this, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it, it's evolutionary, evolutionary learning or novelty search or whatever, where it's just producing all this variation and just absurd amounts of trials of variation, you know, that some survive again, and some don't and some replicate and some don't. And so there's this weird emergent system, you know, system that's that's also learning like i mean and i don't want to get into like what is and isn't learning and this is binary not learning and that's not learning but i'm just saying the system as a whole is accumulating um information it's accumulating mm -hmm. dna it's accumulating some innate knowledge it's accum accumulating memes it's it's accumulating everything that that leads to what human beings do and so it's just you know, that that's why, like, look, machine learning may be doing a lot of the same things. But if you just look in terms of the amount of, like, computation that's gone, gone into even producing GPT-3, it's the tiniest, tiniest, like, 10 to the 10th fraction of the computation that's gone into producing the human mind. So that's where it's really not getting a fair shake. It's just that, you know, if every human mind is basically this 100 teraflop, thing running on like a very few watts and there's been a hundred billion people that have lived and and even before us how many other trillions of organisms led up to it you know there's a lot of learning we got to do 
I want to push back on that just a little bit because I know you, you often make that point, but we have to remember that that was within biological limitations. That was evolving from nothing, from a single cell organism. You know, there were all of these big jumps that had to be made, like when we developed bilateral symmetry. That was a, a very interesting evolutionary jump that happened billions of years ago. Uh -huh. And I'm sure that we could create an artificial intelligence that could shortcut many of these um, impediments that we had in the biological yeah. setting. I don't, I don't disagree with you. Uh, if I could just real quickly respond, I don't disagree with you. I'm just saying that, you know, evolution and what it's produced is over here. And currently machine learning is just really, really far. I mean, we're only at the beginnings of it is my only point. So sure we can do shortcuts, but we're still kind of an order of magnitude or maybe more or a few mm -hmm. away from wherever that point is, where all of our shortcuts are, are yielding enough to uh, produce something that's generally intelligent. Yeah, and I also agree that, so I talked away now evolution by saying it's also a form of uh, shortcut and minimization of energy, but uh, yeah, it's it's amazing what a leap it is because uh, it, it's way more intricate and not understood by us and, and it's absolutely amazing. But I also think that it's not the only way of implementing it, especially with this, um, biological without a biological constraint it might look something different but the problem is we're anthropocentric and we will say you're thinking different you are different not intelligent i'm afraid we will do that well and i, I don't i don't disagree with either of you so I'm, I'm kind of in agreement but i'm just trying to say again it's this continuum i'm just saying artificial neural networks today as much as people have made progress and tweaked activation functions and and added in some convolution and whatever else, you know, the neurons themselves are still pretty similar to the abstraction that was de developed in 1958, right? And I'm just saying <laughs> there's at least two or three other abstractions we could maybe pull out of the uh, neocortex that, that might be useful to us. You know, maybe there's a lot more. I'm just saying, you know, as dirty as evolution is and as, you know, all the cruft and whatever else it may or may not have, I think there's still a lot of valuable processing in there. And for me personally, I think it lies in a lot of the same directions that Melanie thinks, which is the temporal activity. So the fact that the brain is sitting there iterating in this very complex temporal dynamics, I don't think that was just, ah, shit, we got to biologically do, you know, pulsing and temporal computation. If only we could just avoid that. I think it's actually useful. I think that iterative computation, even some of the nonlinear dynamics that, that go on in there are computationally useful. And, you know, there's mounting evidence of that, uh, like, you know, uh, evidence that, for example, the apical dendrites and, and what they do uh, in creating pulse, you know, pulse firings or burst firing enables the brain to multiplex and essentially do this kind of stochastic back propagation. So sure, back propagation may be better the brain can't do it, but maybe if we can do it in silico, it's better. But on the other hand, there may be a lot of dynamics in there that are providing useful from an information perspective computation that we that we could benefit from if we yeah. incorporate it into artificial neural networks. Sure, especially in these beginning steps, I think it's a lot that we can learn from them. But uh, Tim, you asked before, what could an intelligence look like if it's not anthropomorphic? What I think about intelligence, ultimately, it will be energy um, centric in a sense, because all the biological constraints are in a sense, energy constraints too. Mm -hmm. uh, Tristan would love to hear you say that. I was it's just a free energy principle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Although I, I must say that because I've been speaking a lot with Connor Leahy recently, and I, I think a lot of it comes down to computational tractability. Because yeah, you you could say, well, we should have energy constraints, and we should think of intelligence as you know in an anthropocentric way, or we should think of it in terms of flexibility. But at the end of the day, if you have infinite amounts of computation, you can do some quite cool things, assuming you believe in computationalism, and mm -hmm. you're not a fan of Wittgenstein. Of course, he, he wouldn't be a, a computationalist, I'm, I'm sure. But you know, I think to a certain extent, if you if you could build a large enough computer, you could do some cool things. But as as I pointed out, though, you have the problem of Markov of blankets and and um you know clearly defined situations and space it's not like you could just build a massive tree search and and just find some optimal solution because there'll always be all sorts of weird things that you can't um capture in a computer program 
Well, and you could always do more with those same resources. Like what Letizia is saying here is that if you pay attention to, say, optimizing on energy constraints or usage or something, for any given amount of resources, maybe you can do more. That's kind of that's kind of the point, which is just that, okay, fine, we're going to put together one trillion parameters, and then and then we'll be able to do natural language. All right, can you do any more with a trillion parameters? Like, does it does it take a trillion parameters to do natural language, or with that trillion parameters, could I do natural language and play baseball? Like, is that possible? I mean, it's just about being efficient with kind of the the resources. And I think we have a long, long, long way to go before we're even close to some semblance of information efficiency. Yeah. And that must come down because, um, you know, Professor Bronstein and Taka Cohen and, and all these geometric deep learning guys, they talk about symmetries and invariants. And Melanie Mitchell is talking about abstract categories. It's all the same thing, right? It, it's all about being able to take a lot of information and compress it. That's what we need to be able to yeah. do. In some very deep way that I I don't understand, but I really wish I did because it's really cool. Yeah, but this uh, closes down the circle into uh, responding with intelligence is about efficiency because if an intelligence will be ultimately only limited by energy, then efficiency is intelligence because it's how you use that limited energy to do stuff in the world. I agree with you, but for the record, <laughs> some people really disagree with that. They they say no, no, no. It's not about efficiency. It's about you know, information conversion or, or whatever else. But I think the one of the fairest gauges of intelligence is really efficiency. It's like that way, if you give me a black box and it does something and I can measure how efficiently it does that, I can decide how intelligent it is. I don't really need to know its inner workings and how long it took it to teach it how to do that and how much prior knowledge it has. I don't care. I just care how many watts did it take to, how many watts you know in time or whatever did it take to achieve that and then then i know if it's intelligent awesome well fine people it's been an amazing podcast i've really enjoyed myself and it's the weekend oh yeah good so, thank um, you for reminding me that's uh, <laughs> that makes it much happier now <laughs> but um, no. seriously i've had a lot of fun so letitia and keith thanks so much for joining us for the for the debrief and yeah i'm really looking forward to getting this out Thanks for having us. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you.